Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Paula, um, the incoming chair co um, physiotherapy co for the physiotherapy committee. Um, please welcome to our physiotherapy forum. Um, this is the first year that we are actually offering a hybrid model. So um, good afternoon for all of our online members that are joining um, from all over the world. Um, Obviously, because of the pandemic, we have actually faced um, a few difficulties, and unfortunately, some of our speakers couldn't make it to the venue. Um, in particular, obviously, our um, current chair, Heather Mucky, um couldn't be here, and so she's has, she has prepared a video. So we are now um, going to see her welcoming words. Um, can you please put the video? Here's Heather. Welcome, and good afternoon. It is great that most of us can be back together to celebrate our profession, our research, and each other. I am truly sorry that I cannot be there with you today. However, I know that I've left you in wonderfully capable hands. It has been an honor to serve as your PT committee chair during these unprecedented times the past three years. It's definitely not what I expected when I ran, but still a wonderful honor and a great learning lesson. I'd like to take a minute and give a quote from Henry Ford, the success of teamwork. Coming together is the beginning. Staying together is progress. And working together is success. When we work together, we can achieve amazing things. And I challenge each and every one of you to get more involved and do more amazing things for ourselves, for our profession, for research, and for ICS. I look forward to seeing you all in Toronto. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, next, as you might have heard, um, our dearest Joe Laycock um, passed away in August. Um, and so I welcome uh, Chantal de Milan to say a few words um, about her. Thank you very much, Chantal. Nope, not yet. The pictures? So Paula and the Physiotherapy Committee have asked me to talk about Joe Laycock's life. Dr. Josephine uh, Laycock, or Joe, as she liked to be called, had an enormous contribution to both ICS and physiotherapy. Joe sadly passed away on August 8, following a long battle with cancer. To me, she was a friend and a mentor. Joe studied physiotherapy at the Bradford School of Physiotherapy in the UK. She was one of the first physiotherapists to have a PhD in pelvic health physiotherapy. She worked at the Bradford Royal Inf uh, Infirmary for the National Health Services, where she also did research and where I became one of her uh, first research students. And this is a very old <laughs> picture. <laughs> she trained many other UK, sorry, uh, yeah. She trained many other uh, others in the UK and other international uh, physiotherapists in Bradford and later at the Colgate Clinic in Cumbria. So many of you maybe have gone to the Lake Districts. She was always present at the physiotherapy forum and would talk to everyone. So for those of you who are younger who haven't met her, she would probably, if you were alone in a corner, gone and got you and brought you back to the others. She has mentored, supported, and encouraged young researchers and clinicians pursuing careers in continence research, education, and continence practice around the world. Her contribution 
to incontinence care and pelvic health physiotherapy is considered a game changer and a catalyst for what we are today. She was known for her keen interest in clinical question, critically exploring new ways of assessing and treating the pelvic floor. She was telling me, I like to measure things, Chantal. I like to measure things. A few of great, her great accomplishments were the development and validation of a pelvic floor muscle assessment tool that we all know, the perfect sheen, and the designing of a vaginal probe, the Perifor, and a pelvic floor contraction indicator, which are all currently used by many professionals worldwide. For services to the profession, she was honored in 1993 with the fellowship uh, from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy in the UK. And for her service to continent, she received the prestigious OBE from the Queen in 2001. And there is a few st uh, stories around that and the fact that the Queen knew really very well what was in continence. <laughs> and she thought it was very important to address it. In 2011, she received the ICS Lifetime Achievement Award as her contribution to physiotherapy was recognized not only by physiotherapists, but by the other member of our society. But I think most importantly, Joe knew the importance of work-life balance and had many outside interests, including sailing, she had 30 boats in her life, choir singing, accordion, she was playing accordion, and ukulele the, during the pandemics. <laughs> she loved her family, her dog, her walking on the fell and her friends. So she will be sorely missed. Goodbye, Jill. Thank you very much. I think you're going to make me cry as well, yes? Um, not only you, Chantal. Wow. Um, so I'm actually moderating the next session. And um, for those of you who are online, please chat your questions. Uh, please put your questions on the chat. And um, for those of you here, when you have a question, as I said before, stand up, say your name, your profession, and where you're from. Um, our first speaker is Rebecca Reich, which is a physiotherapist and a professor at the Pacific University School of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training um, located at Hillsbury in the United States. She will be talking about uh, mindfulness as a treatment option for um, OAV. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rebecca couldn't make it here, so she has actually recorded her lecture, and she will be available to answer all the questions. So please, um, could you put the video from Rebecca? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Becca Reich, and I'm joining you today from Portland, Oregon in the United States to discuss mindfulness-informed therapy for overactive bladder. And I'd like to thank the ICS staff and the Physiotherapy Committee for allowing me to join remotely on such short notice. We have no affiliations to disclose. Before I get into my content, I'd like to first acknowledge my research partners on this, this work, Drs. Rebecca Doss and Dr. Ruth Zuniga. And we all three wish that we could be there with you in person today. My aims and objectives for the presentation today center on sharing historical information, as well as the current state of evidence for the cognitive components of behavioral therapy for overactive bladder 
as well as to introduce a novel mindfulness-informed intervention for overactive bladder. So let's start with defining behavioral therapy for overactive bladder. Uh, behavioral therapy includes multiple components, including lifestyle modification, such as modifying fluid intake or diet or weight loss. Uh, it includes bladder training, such as increasing voiding intervals, cognitive and physical urgency suppression strategies, including pelvic floor muscle training um, and education. It's what we do as physios for our patients with overactive bladder, but there's no standardized structure for behavioral therapy. If you have experience treating patients with, with overactive bladder, please think for just a moment about whether you use some kind of cognitive component, cognitive tool as part of that therapy, such as things like positive self-talk or visualization or counting, reciting a poem, something like that. Um, how many of us learn to focus on distraction as part of that cognitive process? So asking our patients to somehow distract themselves from their the negative sensation of urgency and redirect their attention on controlling their bladder. Okay. So probably many in the audience have, have learned this and do this. It's the most common cognitive approach as part of behavioral therapy. Mindfulness, which is what I'm going to get into more today, has received a lot of attention in recent years for a broad range of things, from stress management to chronic pain to memory and attention. And my research partners and I were curious about whether mindfulness might be helpful when incorporated into behavioral therapy for overactive bladder. So that curiosity led us to a, a multi-year collaboration that um, resulted in a six-week mindfulness-informed grouped group-based intervention for overactive bladder. So I'd like to lead you kind of how we got there, what we found, and where we would like to go next with this. Dr. Doss's research has focused on the nature of urgency sensation and how that urgency of this part of overactive bladder is different from normal urge to void. And her results highlighted that the, the key way in which urgency differed in people who have overactive bladder is that they describe it in much more emotive terms. They describe it as intense, unpleasant, provoking anxiety, provoking annoyance. So in this way, it has some commonality with other adverse sensory experiences like pain or dyspnea that in that it has affective as well as physical components. So back in 2014, 2010 to 2014, she was doing her PhD. 2014, she was at a workshop called Preventing Chronicity, a Pathway for Physiotherapists. And throughout that training, whenever pain was brought up, because that's what the focus of it was on, was preventing chronic pain. Whenever pain was brought up, she thought of urinary urgency. And she started thinking about how we approach urgency management in our patients with overactive bladder. And what if we looked at urgency management more from the perspective of how to actively engage with that urgency sensation, the way we work with patients on, on different chronic pain issues, engaging with the sensation rather than distracting from it. So she became more and more interested then in her clinical practice in using these ideas from pain science to be incorporated into the way urgency was managed. So using mindfulness for overactive bladder isn't something entirely new. Uh, Baker et al.'s research group has published a couple small studies in which they used a, a, a technique called mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, for overactive bladder. And MBSR is a specific program developed several decades ago by John Kabat-Zinn, and it's an eight-week group-based program focused on different components of mindfulness, such as non-judgmental non awareness, responding rather than reacting, and paying attention moment to moment. It incorporates things like body scans, mindful yoga, meditations, and it's been addressed in several studies on different health conditions, um, including IBS, um, as well as, as urgency incontinence, which is what the Baker et al. group looked at. So they use this in two different studies, and they, they did 
They did MESR, but with no specific emphasis on bladder training, pelvic floor muscle exercise, or lifestyle modifications. They just did it just as exactly as the MBSR program was written. And they only looked at urgency urinary incontinence. Their, their primary outcome was episodes of urinary incontinence. They didn't look at any of the other components of overactive bladder, such as frequency, nocturia, or the experience of urgency itself. Um, they did find some good results, the 2012 small pilot study, um, five out of the seven participants in that study improved after the eight-week program. And then they did a follow-up study in 2014 looking at MBSR versus yoga for symptom reduction and quality of life changes in urgency urinary incontinence and found positive results there as well. So why might mindfulness be helpful for overactive bladder? There's research indicating, again, that there's a strong affective component to urgency. Um, anxiety is a big part of the experience of urgency. Stress can perpetuate urgency. Um, and there's also some interesting research indicating that distraction can actually, distraction tasks, where we're, we're fo changing focus away from the bladder, can actually increase pelvic floor muscle reaction time and reduce the ability to consciously contract the pelvic floor muscles. So it seems possible that mindful awareness of sensation, anxiety and stress reduction, uh, reevaluating the response to urgency, focusing on responding to it instead of reacting or catastrophizing could theoretically be helpful for overactive bladder. Then in 2014, uh, Dr. Das and I were both at ICS in Rio. That was my first ICS conference. We both recently completed our dissertations on overactive bladder. We found this shared interest, started talking to each other about potentially working on a project at some point. And as things go, that took a while uh, for us to gather things together to get going. But in 2018, we started designing a pilot study looking at mindfulness as a component of behavioral therapy for overactive bladder. And we partnered with a psychologist who had training in mindfulness-based stress reduction. And then in the fall of 2019, we ran our, our pilot program. And our primary purpose was to see if the, the program was feasible to implement, if we, could, if we could make it happen. And then our secondary purpose was to examine any potential utility of the program. And we got done just in time. We wrapped up late in 2019, just before the, the COVID pandemic hit. So how we designed the study was by first of all, um, collaborating with the psychologist. Uh, Dr. Doss and I had years of experience working in pelvic health, the research experience on overactive bladder, and Dr. Zuniga, the psychologist who we partnered with, had expertise in behavioral health, in designing community-based programs, habit change, and she had been trained in the MBSR program. She wasn't a, a certified instructor, but she had gone through the training. So we collaborated to meld our knowledge of um, behavioral therapy for overactive bladder with um, her exper expertise in behavioral health, mindfulness, MBSR. We use the MBSR program as kind of a, our basis for mindfulness training for the program, and then we added components of behavioral therapy for overactive bladder, and we modified the MBSR to make it specific to bladder sensation. The MBSR focus is generalized mindfulness activities, body scans, meditations, as I mentioned before, it's not specific to any body part. So we, in our program, introduced that general mindfulness con concept, but then fairly quickly moved into focusing mindfulness on sensations, thoughts, and feelings associated with symptoms of overactive bladder. And we put a really strong cognitive emphasis on cognition of around, like, reframing people's experiences around urgency. And then we, we added in each for each time some of the kind of typical concepts of behavioral therapy for overactive bladder. So each session started with general mindfulness, then we did some activities specific to bladder mindfulness, uh, general education and lifestyle related to bladder health, instruction on pelvic floor training, and, and homework each week. And we utilized a convenient sample just from the community, uh, people who self-identified 
as having overactive bladder and met the threshold for diagnosis on the overactive bladder symptom score. There's are just a few highlights from our program, um, highlighting, focusing on what we did that was different from the typical MBSR, how we incorporated the, the physiotherapy part and how we adapted mindfulness to the bladder. In week one, we started with a, uh, an extensive body scan exercise where the emphasis was on non-judgmental uh, judgmental awareness of body sensations. And then we adapted that to bring awareness to the pelvic floor. Dr. Zuniga essentially rewrote the body scan so that it was focused on the pelvic floor. So she was saying things after the general, general scan, she was saying things like, can you feel your breath all the way down to your pelvic floor? Then in that session, we also looked at anatomy education, um, pelvic floor muscle um, dif differentiation of contraction. We had them practice imagining the stop test um, and ask them to do that at home just to help them identify where their pelvic floor muscles were. Um, we talked a lot about differentiating um, breath and pelvic floor muscle contractions, and we had them do an initial bladdery, bladder diary. Excuse me. Then in week two, we started again with that same body scan, and we as added positive imagery of the bladder and the pelvic floor. Um, we also introduced the, the differences between um, urgency and normal fullness or urge and incorporated that into kind of the neurophysiology of bladder function, uh, including what's the role of the brain in the perception of the sensation of urgency and how can we use quick flick pelvic floor muscle contractions to modulate that contraction. And then finally in that week, we introduced the idea of responding to urgency sensation with mindful awareness instead of reacting or catastrophizing, such as running to the bathroom. Then in week three, we did more review. We, we worked more on responding versus reacting, and we incorporated some specific practice for the responding part, such as when I have urgency, I will hold my pelvic floor muscles and I will breathe with my belly relaxed. We've already taught them how to do that. I will sit or stand calmly or slowly walk to the toilet. So we're really focusing on responding to that sensation instead of reacting. Then in week four, we continued the review, continued to emphasize mindfulness. We introduced uh, voiding inter intervals. We discussed hydration myths. And then we got into concepts related to cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, an approach looking at how our thoughts and beliefs influence our, our actions and behaviors. So this can create in our minds kind of a, a, a cognitive loop, it's called, or a vicious cycle. Uh, so we, we in introduced that, and then we introduced how this could apply to overactive bladder. So let's say somebody has had an uncomfortable or embarrassing or otherwise negative experience related to urgency. That experience triggers thoughts that then in the future accompany urgency, like fear or anger or anxiety, and this can lead to catastrophizing or negative self-talk, such as, I will always have this problem, I'll never get better, I'm faulty, my body doesn't function well. And then these lead to things like hypervigilance around, toil around toileting, um, constantly knowing where the bathroom is, strange behaviors around hydration, planning trips to the bathroom, things like that. So cognitive behavioral therapy for overactive bladder has been described in the literature by at least two research groups who've done small studies on this technique, um, Marty et al. in 2015 and Funata et al. in 2020. So then in week five, we focused on positive reframing of situations that had previously triggered urgency, situations that had previously been problematic for our participants and had maybe induced or started that cognitive loop. So we looked at maybe the negative emotions around that, like the anxiety or stress that it produced, and kind of reframing those cognitive patterns. 
We also made some recommendations for what our participants could do if some of those thoughts or some of those cognitive patterns were um, proving to be kind of overwhelming to them as, as they went through this. So we've introduced the idea of um, seeking psychotherapy for more specific emphasis on cognitive behavioral therapy. Then week six was our final week. We worked on desensitization activities like work desensitizing to problematic situations such as things that are, that are common for people with overactive bladder, running water, the key in the lock, needing to go to the bathroom, um, cold, like the cold aisle in the grocery store. So an example of the desensitization activity is if approaching the toilet is a trigger, then we would ask the person to go stand by the toilet when their bladder was empty and work on their positive thought processes that they had learned um, or to turn on the tap when their bladder is empty and if they have urgency emerge during that to work on some of their their tools that they've learned in the program when it's a lower risk for leakage situation we did a final uh, meditation activity with verbiage adapted to the bladder and we had time for them to discuss their experiences in the program, their goals for moving forward, and other resources that they could access if they needed, such as, again, physiotherapy or uh, physical, excuse me, um, psychotherapy. And then I put week seven and eight in here just to, to indicate that we, the MBSR program is eight weeks long. We intended for ours to be eight weeks, but then we ran into some challenges with timing, with recruiting, and coming up against the holidays in the US. So we kept ours to six weeks, but we actually felt like we made it through everything we wanted to get through in that six week period. And we had our, our work published uh, last year in the Journal of Women's Health Physical Therapy. We were really happy with our outcomes. We felt that the program was feasible and our participants felt improvement, which, which I'll go into here. Um, so we just had four, it was very small, but three of those four people met the minimum clinically important difference on the overactive bladder symptom score, and two out of the four improved on the USA2, which is a urinary sensation, urgency and sensation assessment that Dr. Doss created as part of her PhD research. All four of them perceived benefit from the program. We did the global rating of change scale and they all said that they were either somewhat better or moderately better. And then the surprising outcome was that all of them requested referrals to mental health professionals at the end of the program. Um, so it was, there was a big upwelling of emotional issues that occurred in those, in those final few sessions. Um, we didn't specifically measure mental health parameters as part of the study, but the what the participants reported related to this was that the increased awareness of their thoughts and their feelings associated with their overactive bladder symptoms led them to realize some significant underlying emotional issues that they felt they needed to address further. So while this wasn't anticipated, it's not that surprising given what we know about the connection between overactive bladder and mental health issues such as stress or anxiety or depression. So that was our, that was our pilot study. Um, as we designed that study, we were reviewing the literature on behavioral therapy, but our focus was on creating our own mindfulness-informed intervention. So we then decided to go back and do a complete systematic review to evaluate what's in the literature about the cognitive components of behavioral therapy for overactive bladder. So recall that behavioral therapy includes a lot of different things like diet, fluid intake, lifestyle, pelvic floor muscle training, etc. We wanted to do a systematic review specifically focused on the cognitive components of overactive bladder. We defined a co the cognitive component as any analysis of in a study or any emphasis on changing a thought process related to the sensation of urgency or employment of a specific thought process during an episode of urgency. So that's how we defined a co cognitive component to the behavioral therapy. Our system, our review, 
Our search produced 31 different single arm or randomized control trial studies where researchers were looking at overactive bladder treatment, including behavioral therapy. Only five of those 31 specifically reported including a cognitive component to their behavioral therapy. All the rest did not mention anything related to thought processes, changing thoughts, um, using a specific thought process during their behavioral therapy. So five out of the 31, those five that did provided really minimal description of what they did as, as their cognitive component. The focus was in the five on distraction from bladder sensation or ignoring sensation, um, self-affirming control-related statements such as I am in control, I am the boss of my bladder, and none of them provided a rationale for how they decided to use those specific cognitive components. So we then did some reference tracing, meaning that in the studies that included cognitive therapy, if they provided any reference for their, their therapy, I said they didn't provide much rationale, but some did provide references, we looked at those references and then looked at references in those references until we got back, until there was nothing new left. And in those five studies that included a behavioral, a, a cognitive component to their behavioral therapy, we found 20 different references. Going back to 1981 was the earliest one. Um, this paper called Distrusor Instability Syndrome, the Use of Bladder Retraining Drills with and Without Anticholinergics by Dr. Fantel et al. Um, so they were calling this the problem that they were treating Detrusor instability syndrome, and their premise was that the syndrome was cortical in nature. So that was the, the, the farthest back reference to a cognitive component to treating symptoms of, of overactive bladder. 14 of the 20 references in those, from those five papers were from one or more of, of the th three kind of key authors who we're, we're now considering as pioneers in behavioral therapy for overactive bladder after going through this reference tracing process. So the majority of those 20 references were to papers by Catherine Bergio and or Jean Wyman and or Diane Newman. Um, publications from Dr. Bergio's first one was in 1985 all the way up through 2009. So Again, the five papers that did address the cognitive component, they all pretty much, they, many of them go back to these key studies that um, are expert opinion. They're not high level evidence. So they're, they're, it's, we don't wanna say that we're discounting that wisdom, um, rather we're just noting that where the minimal information that we have comes from is not it's not research-based. It's handing down of accepted wisdom from these, these several key pioneers. Um, and I just want to note that while, you know, we're, my focus is on mindfulness, we, this approach is what many of us have used over the years, and we can think of many patients who have benefited from this contract, concept of trying to learn to be the boss of their bladder or to control their bladder. So we know that behavioral therapy is, has been shown to be effective, but we don't know what parts are more are effective or if certain parts are more important for certain patients than others. Uh, is one type of cognitive intervention more effective than another? So what, we, what I would propose that we challenge ourselves with is to take a look at this accepted wisdom that is providing the framework for our, our, the cognitive components of our behavioral therapy for overactive bladder challenge that and look at different types of cognitive interventions. So that brings me to our future plans. Um, this research, this work has generated a lot more questions for us. We are starting to think about things like, are there different overactive bladder phenotypes that respond differently to cognitive interventions? Um, which cognitive interventions are best? And we would like to take our, our pilot study further and implement this intervention in a larger, uh, prefer, pre ideally a multi-center trial. 
um, looking at mindfulness-informed overactive bladder interventions, it, like what we did, what our pilot study was on, compared to uh, intervention that does not include that mindfulness therapy. So a few concluding thoughts. There's no standard approach for behavioral therapy for overactive bladder. And when authors have included cognitive components to behavioral therapy in their studies, those techniques are based on handed down wisdom that has not been tested. So is it time to reconsider our approach to our cognitive components of behavioral therapy? And mindfulness shows some promise. So I am interested in connecting with others who share this interest. And if anyone in the audience here today is interested in collaborating, I would love to talk with you. And I'd also love to uh, field questions or hear comments about, what, about the presentation today, either synchronously, if that works, or via email. So thank you for your time. Hi, so we have two minutes um, for any questions. So does anyone from the audience want to come ask any questions to Rebecca? Yeah, okay. Rebecca, did you hear the question? Sorry, we were supposed to be connected, but we've lost our Zoom link. So we're going to ask you the question. What was the question? We're supposed to be connected, but we've lost our Zoom link. So we're going to ask you the question. What was the question? So um, Rebecca, did you hear the question? Sorry, we were supposed to be connected, but we've lost our Zoom link. So we're going to ask you the question. What was the question? So Rebecca, does the term mindfulness come under the terminology of behavioral therapy? Rebecca, does the term mindfulness come under the terminology of behavioral therapy? Lost the connection, but it can, can connect you here again. Please. I, I'm sorry, I can't understand it because of the echo. Do you want to type it in the chat? Yes. Okay, if you type it in the chat for her, and then maybe it's fine. If anyone else has I don't have the meeting ID now, it's over there. Um, I wish you would have said it with him. Bring me this computer. What's that? Bring me the computer. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, we're going to try and sort this out in a minute or so, but Rebecca has also said anybody that wants to ask her any questions can forward her questions directly via the email that she provided. So that's going to be an option. So we're going to try and connect my computer, and thank goodness I cleaned up my desktop. <laughs> I can connect the sound. You cannot be, connect it. Okay, connect so we're going to move on to the next presentation. And anybody that has questions can email Rebecca directly. It won't, it won't connect and that. anybody that has questions can email Rebecca. Only with sound, it's fine. Okay, so the answer to the question, does mindfulness come under the term of behavioral therapy? The answer is yes. It would be considered a cognitive aspect of behavioral therapy. We can take another question if anyone has. We can take another question if anyone has. No other questions. Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Can I see if I can get it up? No, we we present no, you no can't. nothing.
Okay. Good afternoon. So my name is Melanie Morin. I'm very pleased to be here to, to chair the next three presentations, especially because they will be about the, uh, the future in research by three of, P of our PhD students. So I'm very pleased to be part of chairing this session. So uh, without further ado, I, I, will, I, I would like uh, to ask you to keep your question up to the end because we have a chat um, period at the end for question. So the first presentation is uh, by Rachel Warman. She's a physiotherapist from Folsom, California. California. She's currently doing a PhD study at the University of Queensland in Australia under the supervision of Paul Hodges and Ryan Stafford. And her presentation has been recorded as she was not available to, to join physically. Uh, she will present the relationship between estimates of the puborectalis muscle stiffness made uh, with shear wave elastography and uh, electromyography in LT men. So can we please have her video? Thank you to ICS and the ICS Physiotherapy Committee for inviting me to present at the 21st Physiotherapy Forum. Today, it is an honor to share the findings from our recent study on the relationship between puborectalis muscle stiffness using shear wave elastography and EMG in healthy males. This study was supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia. The male pelvic floor muscles have some key differences to female pelvic floor muscles, including some unique muscles and features, greater muscle depth and thickness, a more acute pelvic outlet angle, and slight variation in muscle attachment points, such that muscle fiber orientation is unique. These differences require that we adjust our methods to study the male pelvic floor muscles. Our muscle of interest, the puborectalis muscle, is the inferior most portion of the levator ani muscles. It is popularly known for its contribution in forming the anorectal angle, which means that it maintains a certain amount of tone or stiffness to aid in fecal continence. Stiffness is made up of some combination of active or myoelectric and passive or viscoelastic muscle properties. Too little stiffness is considered to contribute to conditions such as fecal incontinence, and too much stiffness, perhaps from radiation fibrosis, fear, or stress, is thought to contribute to conditions such as constipation, voiding dysfunction, and pelvic pain. However, measuring this stiffness is problematic for a number of reasons and highlighted in numerous literature. First, Many measures investigate either one property of tone, for instance, EMG quantifying the active component, or cannot differentiate between active and passive components, making them a combined measure, such as manometry. Some measures, such as dynamometry, are not available for anorectal applications required for male populations. A large amount of literature uses subjective measures of tone, such as digital palpation, and there's limited evidence for digital palpation scales to measure tone through the anorectal canal. The small size depth and access to these muscles makes direct measurement difficult. Differentiation of individual muscles and size is also problematic. Finally, invasive measures may provoke symptoms and alter measurement outcomes. Shear wave elastography may resolve some of these problems. It is a promising, relatively new tool that is less invasive. It provides an estimate of stiffness or shear modulus via a shear wave mode of ultrasound. First, a linear transducer applies an acoustic radiation force pulse to generate shear waves. Tissue displacements are used to calculate shear wave velocity and shear modulus. A stiffer tissue, perhaps from a muscle contraction, will generate a higher velocity. The relationship between shear wave velocities at each pixel is expressed in the color bar and is directly related to the shear modulus so that a warmer color expresses a larger shear modulus. It is a combined, meaning active, plus passive, and indirect measure that is currently under investigation for use in skeletal muscles. However, there are limited studies for its use in the pelvic floor, and even fewer studies for its validation in pelvic floor applications. This study aimed to describe a method to estimate stiffness of the male puborectalis muscle using shear wave elastography and to investigate the relationship between changes in stiffness using shear wave elastography and activity using a novel EMG electrode. Our hypothesis was that shear modulus will increase as contraction levels increase. Participants were included if they were males, 
between the ages of 18 and 65 and spoke English. This study was approved by the Institutional Medical Research Ethics Committee and participants provided written informed consent. Participants were excluded if they had any history of urologic complaints based on the ICS male short form, bowel complaints based on the Rome 4 criteria, and complaints of pelvic pain using the pain portion of the NIH CPSI questionnaires. They were also excluded if they had any history of neurologic, respiratory, or cardiovascular conditions. For this study, we designed and fabricated a novel EMG electrode that features a thin, flexible applicator, a section point, and two sets of electrodes that, when placed into the anal rectal canal, enabled the recording of the external anal sphincter, our feature muscle, the puborectalis muscle, just below the iliococcygeal muscle. Further details about the electrode are reported elsewhere. In order to image the male puborectalis muscle, a linear transducer was placed mid-sagittal over the perineum. The ultrasound unit was first set to B mode, allowing us to identify an individual's anorectal junction and estimate the depth of their puborectalis muscle. To optimize the shear wave measurement, the transducer must be parallel to the muscle fibers. From the midline of the perineum, the transducer is swept one centimeter lateral of midline, then rotated approximately 10 degrees to become parallel with the muscle fibers. To fine tune the orientation, fanning the transducer approximately 10 degrees accommodates for the bowl-like shape of the puborectalis muscle. Here is a schematic of the procedure. A patient was placed in a semi-reclined position. The electrode was placed and suctioned, and then the target muscle was identified via ultrasound, as previously described. Patients were then asked to provide a maximum voluntary contraction, and biofeedback targets were created based on a percentage of the MVC at 75, 50, 30, 20, and 10%. The EMG recordings were synced to the shear wave elastography videos. The participant was asked to perform six second contractions, attempting to hit the target in a randomized order. This was performed on the left and the right side. This was also randomized per case. From the perineal view to now the sagittal view, the electrode is seen in the anal rectal canal and the linear transducer on the perineum, where it produces a B-mode image of the striations of the puborectalis muscle outlined in this region of interest box. Once shear wave mode is engaged, we can visualize the shear wave rendering over the muscle in the same region of interest, in this case with the muscle at rest, and then at 20% of maximum voluntary contraction where you can visualize the shear wave elastogram changing color. Here is a schematic of the analysis process for a set of randomized contraction intensities, 50, 10, and 30% of MVC, and the rest periods. Shear wave frames were selected based on matched time during rest or during a contraction. Images were analyzed in a custom MATLAB program. A one centimeter by one centimeter region of interest was selected at the inferior most visible border of the puborectalis muscle, where you can see very nicely the shear wave color change within the region of interest for rest and each contraction, 50, 10, and 30%. 11 male participants were recruited and shear wave image quality was acceptable for 10 participants who had a mean age of 37 and BMI of 25. When it came to matching set EMG targets, participants were excellent with an average coefficient of determination across all intensities on the right of 0.91 and the left at 0 0.90. These graphs show the linear regression of the EMG and shear wave elastography for each participant at each target contraction on the right and left sides. The coefficient of determination was used for each participant and averaged to obtain the mean of the group. As participants voluntarily contracted their puborectalis muscle to match the provided target, normalized shear modulus values increased with increasing normalized EMG values. So as a group, participants had a strong relationship of the right at 0.59 and a strong relationship of the left at 0.66. No significant difference was observed between the left and right sides. A recently published paper by Moran et al studying puborectalis muscle in healthy females also found strong correlations between shear wave elastography and EMG on the left and right sides. Similar data for the striated urethral sphincter in healthy males was also found to be strong. 
Some key items to consider when using shear wave elastography. First, shear wave elastography renders to a depth of about three and a half centimeters. And the length of the anal canal, marked by the anal rectal junction and the puborectalis muscle, ranges between 2.2 and 4 centimeters. Pelvic floor muscle contractions may further increase this depth as much as one centimeter, which may be a problem for rendering at higher contraction intensities. Further, contractions may alter muscle fiber orientation, and adipose tissue may also alter depth. In conclusion, we were able to confirm a method to consistently image the male puborectalis muscle for the first time. We were able to establish that there is a strong relationship between changes in estimates of muscle stiffness and changes in muscle activity. Our next step is to use this method on a population of males with pelvic pain. I would like to thank the University of Queensland and my advisors and contributor. I wish I could be there, but hope to see you all next year in Toronto. I look forward to your questions and comments. I'm trying to push the button. Okay. There we go. So we will move on to the second uh, presentation of Danielle Van Rijn. She is a physiotherapist and a movement scientist. She owns a private practice and works at the Prosto Clinic, which is specialized, a specialized clinic for, for proctology. Uh, she is doing her PhD on anal, uh, chronic anal fissure at Leiden University Medical Center with professor and urologist Rob per Pelger. Uh, she is presenting pelvic floor uh, physical therapy in the treatment of chronic anal fissure. Please welcome Danielle. <laughs> thank you for your attention um, and thank you for uh, presenting my results of our recently performed randomized control trial. Uh, as you said, pelvic floor physical therapy in patients with chronic anal fissure and these results are from the 8 and 20 week follow up. I'm uh, Danielle, and um, I have no disclosures besides the Proctor's Clinic who made it possible to visit this Congress. The uh, chronic anal fissure is defined as a longitudinal ulcer in the squamous epithelium with one or more signs of chronicity, with presenting symptoms for six weeks or recurrent fissures. We included all men and women aged 18 years and older presenting a chronic anal fissure and pelvic floor dysfunction, dyssynergia, and or increased pelvic floor muscle tone, measured with digital rectal examination and dyssynergia with digital rectal examination and balloon expulsion test. All patients failed conservative treatment with fiber and laxatives or, and, or, and ointment, and they used that for at least six weeks with a right um, instruction how to applicate. The primary outcome of our study was tone at rest during surface electromyographic registration of the pelvic floor before and after pelvic floor physical therapy. Our secondary outcomes contained healing of the fissure, pelvic floor muscle function, the average pain intensity during defecation, on a visual analog scale, complaint reduction with a proctology-specific patient reported outcome, as called the Proctoprom, and quality of life, measured with the Dutch version of the RAND 36. The treatment consisted of five sessions of a mean of 45 minutes in a period of two months. All patients from both groups, I will tell you later about my uh, uh, concert flow diagram, all patients received baseline information about chronic anal fissure, the pelvic floor, toilet behavior, and lifestyle advice. Besides that, intrarectal myofascial techniques like traction on the puborectalis muscle or uh, myofascial release on identified uh, trigger points were part of the treatment. Surface electromyography was used with the maple and was used during the treatment with an intra-anal probe. 
Pelvic floor muscle and breathing exercises were combined with this SAMG, and patients used thermotherapy, like sitting on a heating blanket, um, also as homework. Details of the study are published in uh, uh, our earlier. Patients continued the, the use of the ointment, which is very important, uh, for three, two to three times a day. The results of our concert, uh, our, our flow was uh, like this. We uh, randomized 140 patients with a mean age of 45 years, 72 women and 68 men. Patients were uh, divided into two groups. The first group started immediately with pelvic floor physical therapy. The second group started after eight weeks. All patients visited the pelvic floor physiotherapist, which was me, and a surgeon from the proctor's clinic. At eight week, 20 week from baseline, and also after one year. Although the results of this one year follow up are now under review. The results of our primary outcome. At eight week follow up, the PFP3 group significantly improved from pre to post treatment. In the postponed PFPT group, no significant was found uh, at eight week follow up. At 20 week follow up, uh, significant uh, stayed in the PFPT group and the postponed group uh, improved after they received their treatment. But no significant was found, of course, and we hope that, between groups after both groups received their treatment. Although it should be said that the first group improved even better than the postponed group um, at 20 week follow up. The synergia measured with digital rectal examination was found in a large group it, at baseline. So we, uh, well, we, we think that the synergia is a very important part of, uh, well, probably the, the problem patient, patients experience in chronic anal fissure. At eight week follow up, the, the synergic pattern significantly improved in the PFPT group. And after two, 20 weeks, when both groups received their treatment, no significant difference were found between groups. Increased pelvic floor muscle tone was also measured with, with the EMG and with digital rectal examination, and was also found in a large group of patients and significantly improved in the BFPT group at eight week follow up. And as you can see, no significance were found at 20 weeks. But probably more important, the fissure, how did it go with that? Is there any fissure healing uh, when you uh, treat patients with pelvic floor physical therapy? Well, what we saw, all patients had a chronic anal fissure at baseline. And in the PFPT group, um, the fissure was visible in only 46 percent of the patients. So there was also an improvement in fissure healing at, at eight week follow up. Although not all patients improved and not all patients cured at the 20 week follow up. And at, well, probably other, um, well, there could be other. Uh, um, things involved. Our secondary outcomes contained the uh, uh, Proctoprom scores, so it's a specialized uh, well, uh, questionnaire um, in, from the Netherlands, and um, both groups improved from pre to post treatment at eight week follow up in complaint reduction, although the PFP2 group um, found more, uh, well, was, was better in complaint reduction than the um, control group. The same was found in the fast pain scores. Also, we saw in both groups an improvement in fast pain scores. So it could be that patients in, uh, well, uh, well our, we think that uh, because patients uh, in both groups 
uh, groups improved in first Spain and Proctor Prom scores. Um, they all got information about toilet behavior, uh, lifestyle advice, and information about their complaints. So this could be uh, a reason that also this group, uh, also the postponed group, improved uh, in these outcomes. Uh, when we look at the quality of life, um, we compare the, these patients to the reference values of the general uh, Dutch population. Um, and um, we saw an impaired quality of life in, nine, in eight of nine domains, of the RAND 36. But after treatment, significant lower scores were found in two of nine domains. And from pre to post treatment, significant improvement in the total proof of patients was seen in all domains at 20 week follow up. So the conclusion is that PFPT is an effective modality in patients with CAF and pelvic floor dysfunction. It significantly improves pelvic floor muscle tone, pain, fissure healing, pelvic floor function, complaint reduction, and quality of life. And I would like to thank all the Dutch uh, pelvic floor physical therapists to join me and to uh, support me in this uh, study during the last uh, years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. So we will take the question after uh, the last presenters. <laughs> I'm sure the audience have a lot of them, so you will have to be patient a bit. Um, so the next presenter is Grain Donnelly. She's a physiotherapist who engages in clinical practice. She will start her PhD uh, soon on the mechanical and uh, symptomatic and perceptual impact of targeted compression garment to the pelvic floor. Her presentation today is entitled uh, Postpartum Return to Sport. Uh, Bridging the gap between sports medicine and pelvic health. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here in Vienna to speak with you all. And I have warned some people in the crowd if I become too Irish and speak too fast to let me know. I'm Gráinne. I'm an advanced physiotherapy practitioner based in Northern Ireland in the UK. And I'm going to discuss my journey into the world of research. It basically started out with clinical frustration because I realized that there was a gap supporting clinicians in helping women return to sport and physical activity after having a baby. At the time I was searching, there were no official guidance or guidelines out there. And the more I looked into it, the more I became aware that this large muscle group staring us in the face, the pelvic floor, it was significantly overlooked in the sports medicine world. We only have to look at these two sports medicine publications on groin pain to see that while both include wider representation of the lumbopelvic anatomy, neither include or indeed mention the pelvic floor. And this is surprising given that the pelvic floor is in close proximity to the groin muscles, it also attaches into the pubic bone, and if we consider muscles like obturator internus, it is both a pelvic floor muscle and a lateral hip rotator. So are we truly engaging in differential diagnosis if we ignore this muscle group? When I couldn't find postpartum return to sport guidance, I started to look at what return to sport following injury frameworks existed. And I found this nice one from Clara Dern and her team. It's a phased approach within a biopsychosocial context, which I like. But I felt it lacked some female specific nuances and considerations. And the pelvic health physiotherapist in me longed to be included. I think if we look at this bounding drill video from Tiana Madison, former Olympic champion in the USA, we can appreciate the repetitive nature of the load placed upon the pelvic floor during high impact activities. And we know that the risk and prevalence of pelvic floor dysfunction increases in higher impact activities. And there was a recent podcast put out by the International Continent Society last year where Professor Paul Hodges discussed the need for a balance between mobility and stability at the pelvic floor. 
I want you to remember this analogy because I'm going to loop back to it later, but Paul described the pelvic floor like a trampoline. I hope I don't misrepresent you here, Paul. But he, he described how when load is placed on the pelvic floor, it needs to be able to absorb some of that load before giving back. And when we think of the research that we have studying the behaviour of the pelvic floor during impact activities such as running or jumping, we can understand that there is an anticipatory lengthening of the pelvic floor prior to heel strike and associated reflect, reflexive activity afterwards. So basically, the pelvic floor does what it needs to do without thinking about it, until it doesn't. So if we lack power, lack endurance, lack coordination, if there's any sort of structural compromise, all of these things can impact the integrity or function of the pelvic floor. I love the visual that transperineal ultrasound imaging provides, and I think that part of the problem with the lack of consideration for the pelvic floor, the lack of understanding for it, is because beyond urogyne professionals, very few people understand what the pelvic floor looks like in their mind's eye, what the function or what it does, and therefore it's very much overlooked. Transperineal ultrasound imaging is a fabulous tool for a clinician's assessment, but also for biofeedback for the patient. You can see that the rectum is drawn superiorly and anteriorly towards the urethrovesical junction. This forms part of the continence mechanism by achieving that urethral closure pressure. So simply understanding that and seeing the range of motion involved helps professionals beyond urogyne understand the need to focus on it, train it. It has a range of motion, it has strength, it has function. So back when we became frustrated prior to 2019, I linked in with fellow UK physiotherapists Emma Brockwell and Tom Goom and we carried out a scope and review of the literature and produced this white paper on returning to running postnatal. It was a starting point for some form of guidance and we put a huge call out to researchers out there to focus on this population because there wasn't a lot out there. The following year we published an infographic based on that guidance in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and you can see that it calls for a graded approach to return to impact activity. It's by no means a prescription or protocol. It's supposed to be used as a clinical reasoning tool to, I suppose, meet the athlete or the woman in front of you and decide what level of load she is ready with at any given time and progress is able. I've put the QR code so that people online can access those papers easily. Thankfully, Dr. Izzy Moore stepped forward to our call for research, and together we put out a paper called Multidisciplinary Biopsychosocial Factors Contributing to Return to Running and Running-Related Stress Urinary Incontinence in Postpartum Women. We surveyed a lot of women, 881, and we got a lot of information. I can't discuss it all today, but the key points that I would like to highlight are that women who ran during pregnancy increased their odds of returning to running after pregnancy. This is great news. We're safe to do so. We should keep women active, keep them running. We also, for the first time, were able to place postpartum women or postpartum runners into a fear avoidance model. So this draws parallels with our sports science um, literature, whereby we know that athletes demonstrate fear avoidance behaviors in return to sport following anterior cruciate ligament injuries. And interestingly, it was the sensation of vaginal heaviness rather than stress urinary incontinence that became the barrier from running. So just under a third of women were leaking in our study, but it didn't seem to stop them running. And why that is interesting is because as we start to collaborate with our sports medicine colleagues, we need to make sure that they consider pelvic health to be more than just urinary incontinence because they need to be screening for all the symptoms. We moved on then to see what guidance women were receiving about returning to physical activity after having a baby and how they felt about it. And we published a two-part series in the Journal of Women's Health and Physical Therapy earlier this year. And the general consensus was that women were confused, they lacked understanding, and they had a fear of doing harm. Alarmingly, only one third of women had received perinatal physical activity-related guidance or advice. And this highlights a information dissemination crisis. So we're starting to get more research in this area. We're starting to understand it better, but we're not getting it down to the grassroots where it's needed. Our research on the general population had some um, similarities with what Margie Davenport and her team found in the elite athlete population, whereby athletes were confused, they didn't know what they could or could not do. 
And they also felt like they had to make a decision between entering motherhood or continuing their performance career, and we know this is not the case. A very recently published study by fellow Irish physiotherapist Elizabeth Cullen Quinn and co-authored by Professor Carrie Bow found that very few athletes with pelvic floor dysfunction sought help from a health professional. Instead, they modified or withdrew from certain activities and they engaged in potentially unhelpful behaviours such as increasing their frequency to void or restricting their fluid. So again, we need to get better information dissemination down there. And alongside all of this, we have to consider the evolution of the mother athlete. So whether that's a high performance athlete or your recreational mom looking to get back into some sort of activity, we need to consider what they are doing beyond the clinical setting. So not just their goal to get back to exercise, but what are they doing in their day-to-day -day life? Because there is no sense in us restricting them from lifting, jumping, running, if their life looks that way. So we need to instead make them fit for purpose, do targeted or specific or individualized strength and conditioning. We also have to consider this, I suppose, new phase of their life, which will likely bring about sleep deprivation, compromised energy levels, and challenges to psychological well-being, and how will that play into their return to physical activity and exercise. And also, there's a shift in prioritization, particularly with those performing at a higher level, because not only do they have to consider themselves now, but they have a dependent. And if we're looking for women to engage in targeted pelvic floor muscle training, we need to find ways to support them in doing that, because they're busy and they may forget. Maya Robson's here from Squeezy, and she has a, a stand up in the exhibition hall, and that's one example of femtech or um, technology available to help support women in their compliance and adherence. So because of these wider factors, we put out a clinical commentary in the special edition of the Journal of Women's Health Physical Therapy titled Beyond the Musculoskeletal System, Considering Whole Systems Readiness for Running Postpartum. You can see that we discussed quite a wide range of factors here. I'm not going to go into them all. I'm going to discuss one, and that's relative energy deficiency in sport. Just as the title suggests, it has traditionally been siloed off to the sports medicine world. But I want to tell everyone here today that we have a population of women who are likely sleep deprived, potentially eating on the go and grazing, not getting their nutritional requirements. They may be lactating, expending more energy, and they may be feeling pressures to get back to training or pre their prepartum self. So they may enter that energy deficit whereby they are expending more energy than they create. And this can have negative consequences for bone health, for fertility, and for other bodily systems. There's an update coming up by Margot Mountjoy soon on relative energy deficiency in sport. And I'm happy to hear that it includes postpartum considerations. So all of this Research Outputs to Date essentially took us to answering our call that we put out in 2019 for a female-specific return to sport framework. And I didn't think at that time I'd be part of that team, but we published Reframing Return to Sport, the 6 Rs framework in the British Journal of Sports Medicine this year. The 6 Rs stand for Ready, Review, Restore, Recondition, Return and Refine. And essentially, it's a phase progression, and it's within a biopsychosocial context, but it includes female-specific and transition-specific considerations for moving into and beyond pregnancy and motherhood. Particularly for high, for high performance athletes who are used to structured training environments, the last thing they need at such a transitional point in their life is for all the support to drop away and confusion to exist. They need that support and that sort of programming. My favorite parts of the framework are that the safety of the mother and baby are the overarching concern. And unlike return to sport following injury, we have a huge opportunity, an opportunity to prepare. So we can anticipate the upcoming physical and physiological changes and do something about it, put a plan in place, put out education, really prepare people for what's coming ahead. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to highlight that at each stage of the return to sport framework, you can use existing resources out there, and there's some fabulous ones that you can see that have been put out by organizing bodies, but, um, and it's making sure that we're considering sports medicine literature as well as pelvic health. So what now? Well, my passion for supporting women to return to sport and activity after pregnancy continues, and I'm looking to see how compression garments may um, serve as an adjunct to return into sport. We know that they're currently used within particularly lower limb compression garments, within sports, um, to aid recovery. There's some 
I suppose, evidence for that in reducing muscle oscillation. But targeted compression garments to the pelvic floor are a relatively new concept. There's some subjective evidence that they reduce leaking, that they reduce symptoms of prolapse, and that they give women confidence to return to physical activity. But is there any impact over and above the placebo effect? Well, a study in Japan started to look at this and elements of this a few years ago. They carried out a pilot study and then followed with an RCT. They initially investigated 45 women and they used seated MRI with and without the compression garment on to see was there any change in bladder neck height. And they found that there was a significant change in bladder neck height with the compression garment on. They also found that there was significant improvement in urinary incontinence symptoms. They went on to randomise women in a larger randomised control trial and they included a, a group with the compression garments and two control groups, one carrying out pelvic floor muscle training and one carrying or, that had no intervention at all. They found that compression garments group experienced similar reduced stress urinary incontinence that was comparable to those who were carrying out pelvic floor muscle training. So do compression garments offer an immediate impact on stress urinary incontinence that is comparable to pelvic floor muscle training. It will never replace the need or for pelvic floor muscle training, it's the first line treatment, but could it be an adjunct to serve those women who are padding up and running on in the interim? I carried out a small feasibility study as part of my master's um, in advancing practice and this time I looked at bladder neck height but I used transperineal ultrasound imaging and I investigated that at rest during maximum voluntary contraction and during Valsalva in both creek lying and standing with and without the garment on. I used the posterior inferior border of the pubic symphysis as a reference line and measured bladder neck height. As some people may already be aware, ultrasound doesn't image through compression garments, so I had to compromise the garment, which is a limitation in my study. What we found was that some stuff, like this came up yesterday, body position obviously has the largest effect on bladder neck height, so obviously when we're standing, bladder neck height was lower. The compression garments did not demonstrate overall significance. The study was underpowered. However, when I looked at bladder neck descent rather than bladder neck height, patterns started to emerge. 50% of the women actually did demonstrate that they had reduced bladder neck descent while wearing the garment. 50% didn't. So when I dichotomized that and looked at the data, it turned out that the women who had reduced bladder neck descent were more likely to have had vaginal delivery and had larger genital hiatus that increased further on Valsalva. So to loop back to Paul's analogy, could it be that there's a subpopulation of women there who have increased levator distensibility following childbirth who get some of that resistance from the targeted compression garments and therefore it impacts their symptoms? We don't know. Hopefully my PhD will help answer more of these questions. And to finish with, because there was a great workshop on imaging yesterday, and I've mentioned some today, we recently put out this point-of-care ultrasound in pelvic health framework. It's a scope of pra practice for physiotherapists entering it. Really useful for the wider multidisciplinary team to read, to see how we use it, why we use it, and what our scope is for it. And I'd like to thank you all for your time. So thank you very much. So the, the floor is now open for question. So meanwhile, I would like to thank Nelly to helping me to manage with the uh, online stuff going on at the same time. So I may have a question for uh, Grainy about um, the... Um, you presented, I would like to congratulate you on your review and your uh, infographics. They are amazing. Uh, can you tell us more about the uh, evidence that we have supporting the, the sports that women, that they are allowed to use, uh, the, the, to do, the duration? So how did you come up with these advices? Um, and do, if, if it was an expert's opinion, what do you think that we need to do to have more information to guide uh, our, our clinician? Thank you. And yes, the, like I mentioned in the presentation, the infographic that you're referring to is more a clinical reasoning tool and not to be used as a prescription or protocol. There was a significant lack of research specific to this population, so we need more studies involving pregnant postpartum women, which is happening. There's lots of fabulous researchers around the world currently engaging in research. It just takes time to get that out. Um, so again, it, 
the clinical reasoning is the clinical re reasoning we use day in, day out as physios. You want to look at that person in front of you and have an idea about what their strength and conditioning is like, particularly of the pelvic floor, and what presenting symptoms they have. So then it's from that that you make a decision. You're really looking to see do they have the low tolerance for the type of activity they're looking to engage in. Does that answer your question? Yes, because if we want to have like evidence-based advice for now, that was my understanding that we rely more on a clinical impression and not the evidence. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It's not working. For Anna, the first presenter, Anna from. Can you introduce yourself, oh, please? Sorry. My name is Mifka Oat from Japan, and I'm a physiotherapist. And I have a question and for the first presenter I'm from Leiden University and in Netherlands. Uh, yes. and, um, I, uh, I understood that electric myography and, and called maple and was used in your study. And my question is, and has the EMC and confirmed the intra inter reliability? Yes, it is. It is a reliable measurement, a, me a measure. Uh, it's the maple from Novacare, and there are some studies uh, done before uh, to uh, yeah, to confirm that. Okay, yeah. sorry, yeah. the reliability. It's, it's already used in the Netherlands. Okay, I understand. Then, uh, so it, the reliability of the uh, maple and uh, has been confirmed in men and uh, women yeah. both. In, in women. Ah, in women. In and in men. <laughs> ah, okay. So both yes. men and men, yes. with women. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for it. For it. Sorry. Uh, do, we, do we have other questions from the floor? So I do have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you think are the mechanism of action of physio? Because you measure tone. Is there any other potential mechanism of action that our treatment can help uh, for anal fissure? Yeah, well, what we think is that it could be that the, because of the pain, patients contract. They don't want to go to the toilet because they are afraid that the fissure will break. And that is the general thought. Um, so what we can do as a physio or what we can, um, um, well, make patients and also surgeons, especially surgeons, more, be more aware that it's not only just a wound, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. So um, we think that, and we have proven that the pelvic floor has, has well, it's not the physiotherapy would makes it helpful alone, it's also the mechanism uh, to, to have more improvement in uh, general healing of the fissure. So, um, yeah. Is that the answer of your question? Yes, or, yes yeah? exactly. I, I, w I wonder if it's far stretch, but there is some evidence in menopause women that pelvic floor muscle contraction was also helping with blood flow. I was just curious yes, to is. see is there yeah, we, any well, evidence. We, we used uh, myofascial techniques during okay. the treatment, and we learned patients to do that daily. When they bring in the cream, the DLTSM mostly, it's a relaxation cream for the internal sphincter. But when you, uh, um, well, when you learn patients to do the traction of the, the puborectalis muscle during the treatment, they will help themselves as well every day. Besides that, it's a kind of biofeedback mm -hmm. for the patient itself. So uh, we use that technique. Clinical training on pelvic floor muscle training in pelvic organ prolapse and beyond. So please help me join welcome Dr. Bo. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation to speak uh, at the Physio Forum. It's always nice uh, to be in, in the forum. I forgot the slide about uh, conflict of interest, but I have no conflict of interest. So, pelvic organ prolapse, as you all know, uh, but I just wanted to start with a definition. The Latin is prolapsus, a slipping fort, refers to a falling, slipping, or downward displacement of a part or an organ. 
And this can be anatomical, and we can measure that using the POPQ, MRI, or ultrasonography. Or, and it can be symptomatic, and the best, maybe, uh, way to look at that is the ICIQ uh, vaginal symptom questionnaire. Uh, and the symptom is really best described by the vaginal bulging, which is a complaint of a bulge or a lump or something coming down or falling out to the vaginal introitus. And you all know this POPQ system, and I am very happy to know and to say that uh, physiotherapists are equally good as gynecologists to assess using POPQ. Uh, it differs in different countries whether physiotherapists are doing this actual assessment. In my country, it's been the normal thing that the gynecologists are doing it and the physiotherapists are assessing the pelvic floor function, but the studies show that physiotherapists are equally good as the gynecologists, so you can do it if you want to, and if that's feasible in the, where, in the hospitals or other places where you work. So Kegel, back in 1952, said uh, about pelvic floor muscle training for pelvic organ prolapse that with adequate pelvic floor muscle training, the woman learns to maintain the perineum, the bladder, and the uterus in a higher position. The slack in the supportive muscles will be taken up, and the vagina will become longer and tighter. So there were no evidence for this theory when he was doing his clinical work, but it's worthwhile looking into Kegel because he was obviously a very good clinician, and he knew what he was doing, and he also knew what he was doing when it comes to strength training of the muscles. But uh, today, the theory is more based on what we know uh, with assessment of the pelvic floor. So what we are aiming for with pelvic floor muscle training is structural support. We want to lift the, um, the internal organ and the pelvic floor into a higher anatomical location. We want to have hypertrophy of the muscles, closing of the levator hiatus, and also, this will create a firmness, firmness of the connective tissue in and around the muscles. But we cannot do anything with the ligaments, or maybe not even the fascias. But it's linked into the pelvic floor, and then it will also strengthen the, high, the connective tissue. But there is no evidence for that in this area, I must say. So I have been very lucky to be um, sharing a group of... Uh, uh, very good uh, co-workers from all over the world and also with Chantal in, in the group uh, from the International Urogynecology Association uh, about pelvic organ prolapse and pelvic floor muscle training. So we have looked into the studies that are available to today, but we must understand that when we are looking at different systematic reviews or narrative reviews in this area, uh, it depends how you group the studies, whether you split into different groups or whether you merge or lump these studies together. So you may find different outcomes depending on how you lump studies. So what we have looked at is treatment in the general population. And we have also looked at comparison of peripheral muscle training and other exercise programs. And we have looked at effect on comorbidities from these RCTs. We have looked at prevention studies, and there are no RCTs on primary prevention in the area of pelvic organ prolapse. There are some studies on mixed uh, groups, which mean that we include women with uh, problems, some problems, and some women without. And there is some evidence, as far as we can see, in this group. Then we also looked into early postpartum pelvic floor muscle training. And there are very few studies. And in our opinion, the studies are conclusive when it comes to effect of pelvic floor muscle training in the early postpartum period. And then we also have looked into uh, what happens when you are doing pelvic floor muscle training in connection with pelvic organ prolapse surgery. And the blue ones are the ones that I will concentrate on in this presentation. So again, 
uh, depending on how you group studies, uh, I have listed 13 RCTs on short-term effect of pelvic muscle training to treat pelvic organ prolapse here. The red ones also looked at POP stage. So the result has shown that this 1A level of evidence and recommendation from the ICI in 2017 and from our uh, review that came out last week, so you can uh, read it there, uh, for evidence of pelvic floor muscle training. So typically when we look at the studies who have looked at anatomical pelvic organ prolapse, we can lift one stage. No one has shown that we can lift two, but we can lift from one to zero, from two to one, and from three to two. There are also some studies that did not find this effect. All of these trials showed improved symptoms, but symptoms were measured with very different outcome measures. Some used uh, clinical questions and asking them if they had feeling of lump or not, but some also used questionnaires that was specifically made for pelvic organ prolapse, so included in these questionnaires. And there is also effect in many of these random mass control trials on comorbidity, like stress urinary incontinence. And the NICE guidelines in 2019, I know they should come out with the new ones, I don't know if they did, really. Now, have they done? Anyone who knows whether they have come? They should come out with new ones. But this is from 2019, and they say that peripheral training should be first-line treatment and that should be conducted for three months before you go into surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. And we are so lucky to be physiotherapists in this area. There are no complications or side effects, so it therefore should also be tried first of all. So I would like to look into uh, one specific study that we did in Norway, and because this is the longest uh, trial so far in pelvic organ prolapse and with pelvic floor muscle training. So it was a six month trial, and the control group had information on toilet habits, so not to strain on toilet, and also to use the NAC when they were coughing or increasing intra-abdominal pressure. And then the pelvic floor muscle training group had the same information about toilet habits and the NAC. Uh, and then they had individual treatment. And individual treatment was 8 to 12 contractions per day, uh, three, days, uh, three times per day. Uh, they used a diary and an audio tape and a DVD that was at home. And then they had weekly visits for three months with a physiotherapist. And then every second week for three months. And this is. Ingeborg Hofbrecken, who did this uh, trial. So what we found, we had 109 women randomized. We had only two dropouts, thanks to very good physiotherapy and very good gynecology in this trial. 79% adhered to more than 80% of the exercise sessions. The mean age was 48.8 years, and mean BMI 25.6, and parity 2.4. We included 19 with POPQ stage 1, 65 with POPQ stage 2, and 24 with POPQ stage 3. And we were actually very curious whether we could influence pelvic floor muscle strength and endurance in this group because we had never tried that in the pelvic organ prolapse group earlier. So this is the measurements that we are using. Uh, so we're measuring resting pressure, maximum uh, um, um, uh, maximum voluntary contraction, sorry, and local muscle endurance. So the strength increased with 13.1 centimeter in the peripheral muscle training group and only with 1.1 in the other group, which is really nothing. And the effect size you can see is enormous here, 1.2. So very much in favor of doing peripheral muscle training. It was the same also for endurance, very high effect size. So we train these muscles in the same way as we do with stress union continents, uh, continent uh, women. So we found that there was a significant uh, uh, number of women who had uh, improved POPQ stage in the pelvic floor muscle training group compared to the control group, and also the symptoms. With the mechanical symptoms and also ICIQ urinary incontinence short form was in favor of pelvic floor muscle training. 
But the most important thing for me, and I think this is the best trial that we've ever done in uh, peripheral muscle training coming from, from Norway, is that we really wanted to look at morphological changes. Was there any change in morphology following pelvic floor muscle training? And again, this is a blinded randomized control trial. And we are looking here at the differences between the exercise and the control group. So it's the difference in change between these two, the control and the other one, which is exactly the effect size. So muscle thickness increased with 15.6%. It's the same as we can accept, expect when we do muscle training of the biceps or the quads or any muscle uh, in the body. We had a reduction of the height area of 1.8 square centimeter and a reduction of muscle length with 6.1 millimeter. The position of the bladder neck was lifted with 4.3 millimeter and the rectal ampulla with 6.7 millimeter. So this is really going into what we today know can be the causes of pelvic organ prolapse and peripheral muscle training is going directly into changing these morphological um, um, uh, problems, actually, uh, in women with, with prolapse. And then a very difficult and um, challenging thing is to try to measure uh, um, the uh, reflexive or the automatic function of the pelvic floor muscles, and we try to do that by having a blinded gynecologist and asking the women to, uh, to strain, to do a valsalva, and then we measured the height area, and in the group that had been doing pelvic floor muscle training, there was less opening of the height area during the straining. So we, we are a bit cautious here, saying we indicate that this may be one example of uh, increased pelvic floor muscle stiffness, but that need, it need more um, uh, investigation, of course. So if we look into the exercise protocols for pelvic floor muscle training for pelvic organ prolapse today, the mode in all of the uh, randomized control trials have been strength training of the pelvic floor muscles. They have been done in different ways, but it is strength training. Most of the studies have used individual physiotherapy. Only one did group training in the studies that we have uh, evaluated. The frequency have been once a week with a physiotherapist, and the intensity has been close to maximum in all trials, but the duration of the intervention period really differ from four weeks and up to six months. And of course, we all know that if we do exercise training, this will have a huge effect on what we uh, can uh, uh, experience. And adherence, there is a variation, but in general, we would say that the adherence is generally good in all of these trials. So if we look and compare two different studies, so this was a single blind RCT in women with symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse with stage two or more, 108 women, and this was a three-month trial coming out from DUE in uh, Copenhagen. And compare that with our study, which was a single blind RCT in women with symptomatic and unsymptomatic pelvic organ prolapse, because we were, we were interested in anatomic pelvic organ prolapse, because we wanted to look at the morphology. And we included stage more than one, or one, 109 participants, and this was a six-month trial. The intervention from the Denmark study was that the control group had six 45 to 60 minutes of group lifestyle modules, with our control group had information and toilet habits plus using the NAC. Their peripheral muscle training intervention was lifestyle plus assessment and then group NAC plus home exercises, three sets of 10 maximal contractions for six visits. We had peripheral muscle training with information and toilet habits, the NAC, uh, contraction and 8 to 12 contractions per day, diary use and audio tape use, weekly visit for three months, and then every second week for three months, and that would be 18 visits. And you may say, and I hear that all the time, that 18 visits, it's so much, no one can do that. But if you look into exercise science, my friends, 18 times training with a personal trainer is really, really little. So what are we talking about when we discuss what is really high-intensity pelvic floor muscle training? 
So the results uh, in the Danish study were significantly better results in global scale and pelvic organ prolapse symptoms in the pelvic muscle training group, but no difference in POPQ stage. And in the Norwegian study, we had significant improvement in both stage and symptoms. The limitation of the Danish study may be the exercise protocol and the training dosage. And the limitation in our study was that we included both women with um, and without symptoms. So it may be more difficult to find uh, positive results in our group when it comes to symptoms because we have fewer with symptoms. So you can see there are a lot of uh, equality in these studies, but there are also differences that may explain why we have somewhat different results. But you know, both of these studies showed a positive effect. So then there is another story about the evidence for pelvic muscle training in connection with surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. We found 12 randomized controlled trials. And you can see them here. We took out the study of Jarvis and coworkers from Australia because they included both stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse surgery, and they did not separate between the two when they uh, published the results. And then this was an abstract with very uh, few uh, in, or very little information, so we also took that out. And then the results show that none of the RCTs, except the one from McClurg and coworkers, found any effect of adding peripheral training to surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. The study from McClurg uh, was a pilot study with 57 women randomized to surgery or surgery plus peripheral muscle training. They included women with COPQ stage two or higher. They had one pre and six post-operative sessions with physical therapy, and then we asked the patients to do three sets of 10 maximal contractions per day. And they were all based on palpation, so they knew uh, what they were doing. So the primary outcome was pelvic organ prolapse symptom score. And they found that there were fewer pop, uh, symptoms at 12 months in the intervention group. Uh, but they also say that results should be analyzed with caution because the loss to follow up and that there may be a se selection bias in this. So we conclude in our overview that in nine uh, of the, the other uh, RCTs, there is no additional effect of adding peripheral muscle training to pelvic organ prolapse surgery. So what about hypopressive exercises and pelvic floor muscle training? This is a single brand RCT with 58 women with POPQ stage two randomized to pelvic muscle training, pelvic muscle training plus hypopressive technique or control group. And there were no effect of adding hypopressive technique regarding pelvic floor muscle strength, endurance, or cross-sectional area. In this trial, there were 94 women with pelvic floor uh, dysfunction randomized to eight weeks of pelvic muscle training or hypopressive exercises, including pelvic muscle training. And there were no effect of adding hypopressive exercises on POP subscore. They, di they did not give that really strict uh, conclusion themselves, but this is what we conclude after having looked into this study because many of these women did not have pelvic organ prolapse either. So then we have a single blind anonymous control trial from Brazil again. 75 women with symptomatic uh, stage two pelvic organ prolapse randomized to three months of home training after three individual sessions with the physiotherapist to either hyperpressive training or pelvic floor muscle training. And the results show that pelvic floor muscle training was significantly better in symptoms and quality of life, POPQ and pelvic floor muscle function. This was Oxford grading and surface EMG. So, in our committee, we looked into the trials that had been on alternative methods instead of pelvic floor muscle training, and we can see that there is a huge activity on social media. Only seven RCTs were found, which is in contrast to the social media. Four on hyperpressive exercise, two on yoga, and one on exercise of the hip muscles in an inverse position. The Pedro score ranged, ranged before four, from four to seven out of 10, so moderate to high. No effect of peripheral muscle training was found and that it was, or that it was better than hyperpressive and other programs. 
But what about inversion exercises? This has been used for many years to, 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 to hang up people like that and <laughs> hope that this will change. It may help, we don't know, because we don't have really good trials. But you, this, it's obvious we can't do this uh, in real life. So I think we should use protocols as ever uh, from randomized control trials that have shown clinical important effect sizes. And results from a high methodological quality RCT is in deep contrast to the evidence from clinical experience. It takes four years to do a RCT. Clinical experience is hampered because we don't know whose experience are we talking about. We can all have different experiences. And it's prone to bias because of lack of outcome measures, effect size, attention given to the participants, pleasing from the participant, dropouts, adherence, and long-term effect is not known from clinical practice. And there is a huge confirmation bias. We see what we want to see, we hear what we want to hear. And we ask the questions that we know we can have an answer to. So today, unfortunately, anyone can be on social media. And if you go into this area and look at perigoring and prolapse, it's a nightmare. <laughs> there is no critical appraisal of content. And it's not, even, it's not only that they say that this program is fantastic, it helps for everyone, just pay this money and you can do it. But they also say peripheral muscle training is not working, so do this instead which I think is really serious. So it's sort of science versus social media for the moment. Thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bo. It's wonderful to hear all the latest evidence on pelvic floor muscle training. So um, we um, will invite Chantelle Dumoulin to come to the stage, please. Um, and Chantelle Dumoulin is a physiotherapist and professor at the University of Montreal in uh, Canada. Uh, she holds the Canadian Research Chair in Urogynecological Health and Aging. She received the Carol L. Richards Award in 2018, which acknowledged her exceptional accomplishments in research and her significant impact in the field of pelvic floor physiotherapy. Chantelle will be presenting an update on urinary incontinence and current evidence. So please welcome Chantelle. Uh, so I would like to thank the uh, Physio Committee for inviting me to present to you today the update on urinary incontinence uh, current evidence, and this is from the International Consultation on Incontinence 2022 Conservative Management Chapter. So because of the COVID, um, the ICI book was supposed to be published in 2021. And however, there was a little delay and uh, you will uh, get the book uh, published by the end of the year. So we're supposed to have it published in December. So let's hope. So it, um, for me, it's a pleasure to present that on behalf of my, my team. Um, I have no uh, disclosure except for the fact of my institution paying for me to come here. I'm very, um, I cannot thank enough all the committee members who worked on this chapter. We had 12 authors. Um, and they were coming from all over uh, the globe, as you can see, physiotherapists um, and also nurses, and many who are here even today. Um, and they really worked hard even during a difficult time of COVID to put together all those evidence. So I want to thank you, them again. So as we all know, conservative management intervention or intervention that don't encompass surgery or medication. They are lifestyle modification intervention, pelvic floor muscle training alone or in combination with biofeedback cones. They are electrical stimulation, magnetic stimulation, tibial nerve stimulation, scheduled voiding regimen, and complementary and alternative medicine. 
So today I will not have time to talk about all of them, but certainly um, I will try to put the highlights for you. So we did the literature search between September 2015, which was the end of the last search from the last book, to December 31st, 2020. Now you might say that if we publish at the end of this year, there might be new trials. So what we're doing now is really looking the in the literature to try to find if there is that special trial that we don't want to miss and put in, in our review. So that's going to be done. The primary outcome we used in our chapter was patient reported outcome of cure, cure improvement, um, and quality of life um, related to incontinence or prolapse. So these are, have been the primary outcome for many years, so it's just in continuity with that. And level of evidence and grade of recommendation I'm going to be presenting to you today build on the evidence from the last book. So it's not only the evidence from the, the new material, but it's building on. So it, the outline of what I'm going to be presenting to you today is the conservative management in women and the intervention, conservative management for incontinence in LUTs, because Carrie uh, did a great job as presenting for prolapse. I'm also going to talk to you about the trials who put together the women and the men together. Um, so trials for incontinence in LUTs and men and women together. You're going to have a presentation about men incontinence later on, so uh, also I will not touch that. I will briefly talk to you about conservative management for a neurological patient. And this was new for our chapter. And there are trials, actually, and there are evidence. And I think it's great that we got to get that population to look at the evidence. So if we start with women with incontinence and lifestyle intervention, we found eight new trials. And probably one of the highlights of uh, this book was the fact that we were having more and more prevention trials this time. And I think prevention trials are so important. So regarding weight loss, we had new evidence from a large RCT with moderate uh, risk of bias showing that compared to control, a dietary intervention with fruit, vegetable, and grow, uh, old grain, um, as well as moderate caloric intake, reduces the risk of developing incontinence symptoms one year after the intervention especially for stress incontinence, and this was in postmenopausal women. So the recommendation is that a dietary intervention can be recommended for the prevention of UI and SUI, and this is a level two and a grade B. If we look at treatment, again, for lifestyle intervention, there was a new trial on moderate physical activity. So, um, a new RCT with moderate to high risk of bias suggesting that a three-month physical activity program is better than no exercise to reduce LUTs in overweight young women with urge urinary incontinence. Physical activity could be recommended to overweight young women with UUI. And this was a grade C um, of recommendation because of the risk of bias were a little higher. Coming back to dietary modification, and in the same trial that looked at women who didn't have incontinence at the start of the trial, or prevention trial I talked to you about before, there were also women who had incontinence. And we can see that dietary modification, um, those incontinent women um, participating in dietary modification were less likely to report incontinence and stress incontinence as uh, compared to the control group. And here again, we have a grade B, a dietary intervention can be recommended for the treatment of UI and SUI. And this is uh, very important because in lifestyle intervention, we mostly have cohort studies, so now we're starting to get um, a randomized trial. If we look at pelvic floor muscle training for perinatal women, um, we had eight new trials and one follow-up trials. However, uh, it didn't change the level of evidence. The level of evidence was one and grade A 
for both the antenatal prevention and the postnatal treatment. So in addition to the previous trial, this new trial supports the effectiveness of pelvic floor muscle training during pregnancy to prevent stress UI in late pregnancy and up to mid postnatal period. And the trials in postnatal treatment uh, shows that it's significantly better uh, uh, pelvic floor muscle training supervised compared to a control group up to six months post-treatment. There's still a need to do a trial to look at the result long in the longer term, um, but I think that it's already very good for that population. Women with UI, PFMT, Prevention, again, new trials, um, two small to moderate sized trials with moderate risk of bias uh, show that PFMT reduces the prevalence of incontinence in young athletes and postmenopausal women. So interesting to give PFMT to those young athletes and postmenopausal women. So this is a grade B, this is new. For treatment, we had uh, 12 new trials, and again, the level of evidence and grade of recommendation didn't change. Uh, what was new was mostly that um, there was an expansion of the ages. There were younger and older women, so a PFMT appears to be effective for a whole range of age. Also, there were, there were more trials about mobile te technology, which appears to be uh, also helpful to treat uh, incontinence. So supervised pelvic floor muscle training should be offered as a first-line conservative treatment for women of all age with incontinence. Uh, what is the most effective program in that area? Melanie worked a lot. <laughs> there were 34 uh, new trials, 12 comparison. Um, group versus individual, PFMT, there was evidence from one large RCT with low risk of bias that sup uh, sh showing that supervised group PFMT was non-inferior to individual PFMT in women aged 60 and over with stress and mixed incontinence. I just want to make the precision that those women were thought one-on-one -on -one with the physiotherapist to contract their pelvic floor, and only those that knew how to contract or were able to contract or uh, did continue in the trial. So supervised group PFMT should be considered in treating older women with stress and mixed UI. So this is good because it can increase the number of women being treated. If we look now at direct and indirect PFMT, there has been a few more trials on indirect PFMT, and as you know, uh, those indirect methods is the method Carrie was talking a little bit before, such as hypopressive, Sapsford, the Paula method, and there's no clear benefit of using indirect, bio, uh, indirect PFMT rather than direct PFMT. So this is grade B, new. And the addition of biofeedback to pelvic floor muscle training versus pelvic floor muscle training alone. Well, there was a really a nice, um, well-conducted, large, uh, uh, randomized control trial on PFMT with clinic and home-based EMG biofeedback. And it shows that biofeedback does not provide additional benefit to PFMT in stress and mixed urinary incontinent women able to contract their pelvic floor. And this was a level one grade B, and no clear benefit for adding clinic biofeedback to PFMT um, was a grade A, and no clear benefit for adding home-based biofeedback to PFMT was a grade B. So now that we know this, I think we need to do more trial and trying to find to whom, to which women should we recommend biofeedback? Because clinically, we certainly know that there are some women uh, that um, uh, like and also could benefit from that. So the, the trial should go that way now. If we now look at bladder training, for bladder training uh, in um, women with incontinence, the number of new trials were three, 
But there was a very good ICS consensus statement containing 24 trials, and it, it helped us um, know what is the most appropriate bladder training uh, protocol. So evidence from that new trial and the consensus recommend that when we do a bladder training program, there is supervision, not just a sheet of paper. The duration is at least six weeks. There's coaching and follow-up support. There's verbal and written information on education. Voiding uh, intervals are agreed between the clinician and the patient. There are urge suppression techniques. Walking to the toilet at a normal pace should be recommended to the patient, and encouragement to improve self-efficacy -effic should be given. And this is level of evidence two, grade A. Now, if we look at complementary uh, intervention, in our chapter, we looked more into this year into yoga and also acupuncture. And uh, although there is a lot of uh, publicity about doing yoga, not the pelvic floor 101, but doing a class of yoga, what you can see from the pool data of those three trials is that no recommendation is possible because right now there are conflicting evidences. An interesting uh, found uh, that we had, if we look at now men and women, uh, together in a trial, and this was for um, tibial nerve stimulation. In that area, we had 13 new trials. There's uh, really a lot of activities in that area. And this was for treatment, and we found one small well-conducted RCT demonstrating that transcutaneous tibial nerve stimulation was not inferior to percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation for decreasing daytime frequency and UUI in adults with idiopathic OAB. So TTNS is a safe treatment option and not inferior to PTNS for treating adults with idiopathic OAB. So this is great news actually because it, can, it could give more access to this treatment to our patient. So this is level of evidence one, grade B, and this is new. If we now look at uh, men and women and the trials on magnetic stimulation, well, unfortunately, this is probably the modality where there is the least evidence. At le uh, in men, there, is, there were no new trials and there were very few in the past. In, is it appearing? What am I doing? Oh, the Zoom is finished? Um, in women, um, there were very few trials, and there was a small to moderate size RCT with moderate risk of bias, showing that MSTIM was more effective than a sham to cure or improve UI. However, the impact on the quality of life was conflicting. So at this point, because those trials are so poor, merci. Those trials are so poor, we have a level of evidence two for this one, but we have grade D for this modality. And I know that we have seen uh, publicity about those um, chair. I think you have to be careful, and sh this should not be your first-line treatment. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but this is, the <laughs> this is the evidence. This is the evidence. Okay, so neurological patient with UI, uh, PFMT, we were really happy to see that there were 16 trials, 16 randomized trials in neurological patient of different condition. In prevention, unfortunately, there were no trials. In treatment, there were two well-designed high-quality studies in MS, one in MS and one in Parkinson disease patient demonstrating a significant improvement in incontinence symptoms, lots, and quality of life following supervised or home-based PFMT associated with either biofeedback or with intravaginal electrical stimulation, bladder training, and behavioral management. So the recommendation, PFMT alone or in 
combined with other active treatment is more effective than no treatment or less active treatment for the management of OAB and related symptoms in patients with MS and Parkinson's disease. And this is a grade B also new. So I know I didn't go through, and there's many other finds. I really want to suggest you to read it. I have two minutes, that's okay. Uh, but when it's out in December, it's really worth. There's a lot of new things. So overall, there is an increasing evidence to support conservative management as the first line treatment of incontinence in women and neurological patients. Um, there is also um, evidence for men and there is also evidence for prolapse large, well-designed trial that use validated outcome and long-term follow-ups uh, are needed to evaluate the cost effectiveness of prevention. Now we have prevention trial and treatment of incontinence in LUTs. So I would like to finish just by thanking all the students that helped us with the referencing and the searching during the writing of this chapter. And I thank you for your attention. Sorry, Chantel, I know you have heels, but do you mind joining us back up and Dr. Beau, Carrie, and Chantel? It, it'll just give us more of a kind of discussion uh, rather than questions and answers. And please do use the microphone. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, um, Paul Hodges from Australia. Um, both really nice presentations. And Kari, uh, uh, two, two questions. One that's really challenging for all of us, and that is to see whether you've got any suggestions. And the question is around, you, you, you've highlighted at the end the problem of social media. And we as researchers have a huge problem. We are conservative. We reference the, um, the criticisms and the uncertainty about our data and our research findings, and we're not very convincing to the community. When we're faced against people who are influencers, or whatever we might want to call them, who are very confident in what they believe and are very convincing. So what's the solution? How do, how do we find a balance of changing that? <laughs> Well, thank you, Paul. It's, uh, it's a challenge. And, and I think most people say that, please, you have to go out to social media. But then they don't realize that it really takes four, hour, four years to do an RCT. I cannot be everywhere. You cannot be everywhere. Somebody needs to do the research. So, but I, I think maybe we should more, be more active in saying that they are not they are not. They are. They are actually lying. <laughs> so, so maybe we should go out more often to talk about methodology and what you can believe in to try to uh, educate uh, the people. I, I think, at least in Norway, COVID was a fantastic handling from the government because there we had top researchers saying this we don't know. Here we have this sort of studies, but we can't trust that yet, but we have to deal with this, we do this, but we don't know. It was, I use it for all my master students and PhD students. Look at this, what did they say? Because if, if people can be more educated in being critical, so because I don't think we can handle social media as well. I'm, I'm not capable of doing that on top of all the research, and I think you are quite busy yourself. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're really right. COVID, may, maybe it did do something good, and let's, I think as a community, we need to really try and capture that and keep riding on it and keep reinforcing what science is about. Yeah. Mm. Maybe yeah. I, I can add to that. I think 
It might not be the role of individual researchers because, like Harry is saying, we're all busy clinicians and and researchers and teacher. But I think it it should be the role of our association to support. And uh, Paula was giving me a good example this morning about. Uh, the physiotherapy association during the COVID, eh? that's what you were saying, that you, you made, they made videos to inform the women about pelvic floor exercise, but the right way not to contract, you know, everything and what you see on the internet. So I think we really need uh, maybe the physiotherapy committee from the ICS and association like that to say it's, it's false and this is what you should do. Is it, uh, well, uh, <laughs> so we, we did one thing, Helena Frawley, Jean Hayes-Smith, and uh, Melissa Davidson and me, we, we answered to APTA, had actually a um, uh, podcast with a physiotherapist telling about this fantastic new system. Everything was wrong with the, everything we had done in, in science before that. So, so we, we used a lot of time in trying to respond to that. And it ended up with them taking this podcast away from their page, which was good. But we can't go on doing that for everyone, because there are thousands of them. And as you say, they are very verbal. They are so good in selling their products that we will never get close to even doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, I, mm. I, I quite agree with you, Carrie and Chantal. It's, it's, if you have to go on social media, then that will take you all day. And, and I think one of our objectives from the physiotherapy committee is actually to challenge that thought. And I think coming on from, for example, on the board of trustees today, um, we question the use of Twitter as a way of promoting um, the committee, but with that, actually actual science and promote what is already out there. So it's one of our objectives. Thank you. It, my second question is a research one. Um, <laughs> the, and the comment you made about um, pelvic floor being potentially stiffer and with and the measure you made with the Valsalva. Um, and I just have one question around that. And and I'm not, I'm not questioning whether it's a measure of stiffness, but Valsalva is re getting a, a person to bear down or to, to depress or whatever, um, do, a, a, do a Valsalva manoeuvre. If a, if a woman has been training for weeks and weeks and weeks to contract their pelvic floor and learning to activate this thing to give support, are they actually going to be able to, in a descending neural way, let that muscle go when they're pushing down? Or are they going to have learnt that, I actually want to take advantage of that muscle and not let it go? So are you measuring a different strategy rather than a different muscle property because of the, what they've done. Yeah. Kate, <laughs> because I, I totally agree. And I myself, I would never do a Valsalva. I can't do it. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. You're too strong. Your pelvic floor is too good. No, but I can't do this oh, Sorry, go ahead. I've just got, whenever we're done, I'll, I've got a couple of um, questions on chat, but please go ahead. Anna Koshla from Poland. I'm a physiotherapist, and I've got a maybe basic question uh, for uh, Mrs. Caribo. Uh, in uh, your research, you use, uh, uh, your, um, you tap patients to, to do about 30 contractions a day, if I uh, could uh, count it. Yes. Why only 30? Why not 100 or 200? Well, uh, uh, Arnold Kegel, said, he said 500 yeah. per day. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's a lot. And I think it's very difficult for modern women to accomplish to do that. So I've always been following strength training principles. So that's why we say 8 to 12, close the maximal contraction three sets per day. OK, but uh, you mean? Uh, how long is one contraction? One contraction is at least six 
seconds, and that's based on also exercise uh, science, old book in the, the textbooks of work physiology from uh, Rudal and uh, others, Osran and Rudal. So, but you know, this is really not strict science. And if you have a group that haven't trained the pelvic floor muscles before, and you know that they're doing it correctly, they start the exercise, I think anything you do will make it better. So it's only uh, that we know from exercise science that these are the most effective way and maybe the fastest way to get the best results. But you can do other things. So I'm not saying that other things is not working, but this is what we have done. And we have shown it in so many RCTs that it is effective. But there are other ways of doing it too. Hello. Um, just a quick question. Uh, um, just from what you're saying, Kerry, um, do you find sometimes when you're doing a pelvic exam and that patient only has an endurance of two or three seconds, then you'll say, well, try to hold for four? You wouldn't try to get them to hold for six seconds because no. it's inachievable? Uh, we cannot hear you. I, I was just asking if um, during a pelvic examination, if um, Kerry was to find like an endurance of two seconds hold only, would she try to change the, the hold or the endurance time to lower it so it was achievable? Yes, exactly. If you always follow the patient, what they can do, and then you go on from them. That's the aim, is to get to six to eight seconds and to do all these contractions. Yeah. Okay. Magdalena Rechberger, physiotherapist in Vienna. Um, I would like to know, uh, have you seen some differences due to the age of the women, so that younger women, for example, see result, results uh, faster? Or should we recommend um, older women to do it more than six months? Because I think three or six months are a very short time to, to do it. Are you talking about incontinence or prolapse? The prolapse. Prolapse. Yeah. So I, I don't think we have studies that have compared uh, younger women with elderly women. So uh, again, I would go with what the, the patient is capable of doing and then build on from that and trying to get into, into that. But maybe some elderly people would need more time. But you know, we have also so many RCTs now, and you can talk about them yeah. because okay. they are very <laughs> in elderly. Uh, I think uh, for incontinence, at least, what we see is often as they get older, there's a combination not only on, of stress but also urgency and continence. And there's there has been in the literature. Um, studies showing that uh, the, the pelvic floor position is lower, so maybe there's a need to do a little bit more for them, uh, at least for incontinence. But like Carrie, I think it's dependent on the patient. We have trials that are very systematic because we are doing trials, but if you have your patient in the clinic, um, depending on where she starts, it, it may uh, be needed a little bit less or a little bit more. Thank you. I'm going to thank everyone for all the questions. I do see a line, but in the interest of trying to stay on schedule, I'm going to have to move on to the next session. Thank you both very much for excellent <laughs> presentations. Okay, so, hi everyone, my name is Nelly Fagani, I'm a physiotherapist from Canada. I sit on the physiotherapy committee and this is like my last year. So it's my privilege to moderate this session on men's health. We have two renowned experts who will talk about this topic and we will have some questions for Paul after. Um, so Paul Hodges, everyone knows him, he's a physiotherapist, a neuroscientist and professor at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. He is a recognized world leader in movement control, pain, and rehabilitation. He has published over 500 peer review articles in various domains, including pelvic floor dysfunction in men and conservative treatment. Paul has received numerous national and international research awards that span basic and clinical science. Uh, today, Paul will present research updates related in men's health. So please welcome Paul. Thank you.
Um, thanks, Nelly, um, for that flattering introduction. And what I'd like to talk about is um, men's health. And what I was asked to do was to give an update of um, what we've been doing in trying to form a research foundation for what we do in um, recovery of continence function in men after prostatectomy. And um, in, the in the lab, we are interested in a whole spectrum of different men's health conditions, but what I'll talk about today is um, related to incontinence, particularly after prostatectomy. So, what I thought I would do is to talk particularly around a series of um, experiments we've been doing, trying to understand what it is that we see when we do a transperineal ultrasound assessment of a man at rest, doing a pelvic floor contraction, how that changes in a whole range of different contexts, and how we might be able to use this, um, this tool to advance our practice. And what I'd like to do, first of all, is to just give a little bit of a summary about what, what do we think we're looking at in terms of what is the measure. I want to talk a little bit about the impact of body position, and we heard before around some ideas about the importance of evaluating pelvic floor when someone's upright and the, the change of position that might occur. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about well, what happens when you're imaging in a standing position. Can you actually do it? Can you, and what can you assess? I want to talk a little bit about what happens when someone has a radical prostatectomy, and there are one of, well, one of the things that I think is most exciting and fascinating about understanding incontinence in um, men after prostatectomy is that, like everything we do in rehabilitation, there's never going to be a one-size-fits-all because everyone is unique and ultrasound imaging is giving us the opportunity to understand what is actually happening in a whole, all of the different um, muscular components of continence in the pelvic floor and allows us to understand, well, what are the things that we may need to target for that man because every person is different. I want to talk a little bit, but not very much, about repeatability. The measure is repeatable. That, that's it, I've done it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the reference for who, where to look for for that piece of information. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about well, what happens to evaluating the measure in upright positions after a man has had a prostatectomy. And then I want to talk a little bit about where we're going, what are the new things that we're doing currently that are about to um, be submitted or published. And what I'll talk about first then is the measure. So what can be assessed with transperineal ultrasound imaging in men? And what, when we started working in this area about 20 years ago, we um, put the ultrasound transducer on the male pelvic floor and didn't know what we were seeing. And there were things happening that we didn't understand. And for the last 20 years, we've been trying to understand what that is. And what's evolved has been some really interesting observations about being able to observe the relative contribution of all these different components to um, continence in men. So you've seen lots of ultrasound images in this session. In, every, in multiple sessions in this conference, people are showing transperineal ultrasound imaging, um, particularly in women. And usually what's observed is the forward and ven the ventral and cranial displacement of the um, bladder neck and the anorectal junction. So when you look transparently perineally in a man, you're looking up through the perineum, you're going to be able to see the urethra as it curves around, you're going to be able to see the bulb of penis, you're going to be able to see the anorectal junction, you're going to be able to see the pubic symphysis and the bladder base. So here is the pubic symphysis, here is the urethra, there is the bladder base, there is the bulb of penis, there's the anorectal junction. So in women, what you expect is cranial and ventral motion of the bladder neck, particularly ventral motion of the anorectal junction, and those things we can see. And they're primarily related to contraction of pubic rectalis, pubic visceralis, pubic coccygeus, whatever it is that you might, might be your favourite name for that particular muscle. Um, then there's going to be motion that's related to the bulbar cavernosus, which is going to be compressing the bulb of penis. So it's compressing here. So it's going to cause a, a ventral motion of the bulb of penis as it compresses. And then there's going to be, because the sphincter is a horseshoe around the front of the urethra pulling back to the um, perineal body, you'll actually see a dorsal displacement of the urethra 
pulling back. So it's, it's like the Boba cavernosis and um, sphincter compressed together. Now, if you look into the literature, in men's health, the only muscle you'll really ever hear about is the sphincter because it's the muscle that's at the dorsal pole, at the distal pole of the prostate. It's the muscle that is most potentially compromised by prostate surgery. And it is a muscle which is primarily associated with symptoms of incontinence in men after prostatectomy. You'll very rarely, if ever, hear of puba rectalis, puba visceralis, puba coccygeus, and you'll never hear of boba cavernosis as it having a role in continence because it's usually described as a muscle that's involved in ejaculatory function but nothing else. And what I can assure you is that the first muscles that contract if you cough are your boba cavernosis and your sphincter, and they contract together simultaneously. And it's almost like what their function is, is to squeeze the end, get the urine back up into the bladder, and then puba rectalis can do what it, what it needs to do to support the, the bladder base. So the boba cavernosis is actually part of this continence mechanism as well. And I presented yesterday a little bit of data that we've shown of the superficial pelvic floor muscles having a role in continence in, in women as well. And um, then puba rectalis, it is going to come in later. It is a muscle that has clearly an involvement in men. In the female literature, you hear mostly around the puberectalis, puberococcygeus, um, the levator ani group, because of the compromise due to vaginal delivery. So different gender, different bias in the literature. Both genders have both muscles, and both genders have both muscles being important. So we need to remember that. So here's an MRI, and this is just to give you some orientation, because MRIs are a little bit easier to interpret. So here you can see the urethra, there's the bladder. So with contraction, you can see that the whole anorectal junction bladder base is being pulled forwards by the levator ani. You can see that there is this forward motion here from boba cavernosis and dorsal motion here from the um, urethral sphincter, compressing that, dis that mid part of the urethra. So the next thing I'm going to show you is a video, and it will show you very beautifully those three movements, the sphincter pinching back, bulbar cavernosis compressing forward, and the anorectal junction, puberectalis pulling forwards. So in men, we can observe each of those three muscles, uh, those muscle groups. We can quantify that. We've got bony landmarks, so we can make some very specific um, um, measures of those in men in a whole range of different contexts. And Here's a cough, and there you can see there's this pinching distally of these two muscles, and then there's actually an eccentric contraction of the levator ani. When you cough, it does get those, those muscles get lengthened. They're supporting, but they are lengthening. But there's this pinching distally of the urethra that's happening first to maintain continence. So, what have we been doing for the last few years? Well, we've been locked in Australia, locked in Australia <laughs> during COVID. Um, I never thought I would look at a map of the world on the government travel site and it said that there is nowhere in the world you can go. And, and in fact, it was illegal for us to go. It was outrageous. Very happy to be here in Vienna. So while we were locked in Australia for two years, we did lots of research and we were able to have human participants and we had a clinical trial underway and we've done lots of analyses trying to investigate in great detail some of these measures. So the first thing I want to mention is a paper that came out right at the start of COVID, and I have presented these data before, and it's a comparison of men who've had a prostatectomy, we're measuring them months to years later, and then we're not measuring the same people before and after, it's just two groups of men, those who have, re who have recovered continence and those who have not. And those data, we find that, so green is control men who've had no history of prostate cancer, blue is men who are continent, orange is men who are incontinent. And what we see is that when a person does a, pelvic, a voluntary pelvic floor contraction, healthy individuals and men who are continent elevate their pelvic floor, so they have a, a, their urethra vesicle junction pulls forwards, their pubic rectalis is contracting and shortening. On average, men with incontinence push down. So there are some who pull up a little bit, but there are some that push down, and that's also been observed in women. So a bit too much pressure from above. Then if we look at the sphincter, men who are continent 
have good contraction of their sphincter, so good shortening. Men who are incontinent have a lesser contraction of their sphincter, so they have less ability to compress that mid-urethra. And their bulbar cavernosis is also less um, displacement, so there's less pinching distally, and they're pushing down from above. So too much pushing down from above, contracting their abdominals, holding their breath, doing whatever, and then too little contraction below. So both of those things add together to have a negative impact on your continence. And they're significantly correlated in that your severity of incontinence is related to how much you're able to shorten the sphincter, how much you're able to elevate the bladder, and how much you're able to compress the um, bulb of penis. So all of those things are correlated to some degree. When you cough, it's even more exciting because what we see is that, particularly looking now around what happens with bulbar cavernosis and urethrovesical junction, the men who are continent are actually better than healthy men. The men who are continent contract their bulbar cavernosis more than healthy men. The men who are continent um, elevate or get less depression of their urethrovesical junction during a cough. So that means that men who are continent after a prostatectomy are superhuman. And that's because when you have your prostate out, you lose something. You lose the smooth muscle of your urethra that's in your prostate. You lose your automatic control of continence. You've got to do something else. And these men have to do it better than a healthy man to maintain continence, which is fascinating. We also have other data from a mathematical modelling study that shows that these two muscles, bulbar cavernosis and, your, and um, puberectalis, actually have to work very, very well to have any impact on continence, really. The sphincter is quite efficient, but the other two muscles, they actually have to change their function a lot to be able to compensate, and that's why it's superhuman. So, in these studies, what we've been able to show is that if you take two groups of men, they are different. They have less displacement of the sphincter, more likely to depress their, um, their bladder base, and when they cough, they're superhuman. But that's not telling me what happens between men before and after prostatectomy. I want to know what impact does surgery have on the continence mechanism. I want to know, are there things about the way a person functions before surgery that will determine how well they go after surgery? And I also want to know, well, can I evaluate these muscles in standing? Because most men complain of symptoms getting into standing or during doing tasks in standing. So we've done a whole series of studies trying to investigate that. And um, the questions we're asking is, when you get into standing, can you actually do an ultrasound measurement in a man? And then how does that affect the measures that we make? And it's not really rocket science, this. But so this is the first study that was done by David Cowley, who's a PhD student in the lab at the moment. And what we found was that when a man stands up, and I'm showing you here, the white dots are the position of a healthy man in sitting or a reclined position. The black dots are the position when the man stands up. So these are men with no history of prostate cancer. And what you can see is that the bladder base drops down a bit, the anorectal junction drops down a bit, the um, distance between there and there gets shorter, so the piborectalis is actually contracting a bit. So when you stand and you've got gravity depressing down on your pelvic floor, it has to work a bit to hold on to that, so it shortens a bit. So your, your anorectal junction gets pulled forwards, shortened position. There's a little bit of, um, oops, sorry, a little bit of elevation of the um, mid urethra, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So. When you've got gravity pulling down, there's greater demand, things drop down a bit. Not rocket science. It does mean that they are sitting lower and that the muscles, the um, puberectalis has to contract a little bit. The fact that the mid urethra gets pulled up is a bit surprising because that muscle can't actually do that. But what it shows is that we have to remember that the pelvic floor is actually quite complex and that all we're seeing in that 2D sagittal view is what's happening with puborectalis and the sphincter and bulbar cavernosis, but it's not telling us about the ischioniliocavernosis, um, coccygeus as well. And those muscles are the ones that actually do the lift. So potentially that lift of the mid urethra is because those other components of the pelvic floor are actually lifting the whole thing up. And so it may actually mean that even though we can see a whole lot of things of the pelvic floor with this particular view, we can't see everything. So we, st we still need to think about other components of the pelvic floor. What about prostatectomy? What does it do? So some hypotheses. 
The first thing is, of course, that most of your smooth muscle of your urethra is in, within your um, prostate. So the internal sphincter is thickest at the top, it's thinnest at the bottom, and so when you lose your prostate, you lose most of that smooth muscle. There will potentially be some retained, but the amount that you, you're left with, it varies between men. So you're going to lose the automatic control of continence. One of the problems with ultrasound is that we can't measure that. We don't know. We can't measure the relative contribution of the sphincter, of the, of the smooth muscle sphincter with ultrasound imaging because we can't ask men to turn it off and on because it's not voluntarily controlled. But what we can do is look at all of the other components. So what do we expect? Well, it's been argued that 40 to 80% of men have compromised sphincter function post-prostatectomy. Maybe that's because of muscle injury, because it's right at the distal pole of the prostate. It could also be because when they suture the urethra back to the bladder base, those stitches go somewhere, and where do they go? Right into the sphincter. Um, and it potentially compromises the mechanical function. There may also be nerve injury. One of the things we need to remember is that nerve sparing prostatectomy is not about nerve sparing the innovation of the sphincter. It's about um, sparing the autonomic supply of the vasculature so that the man can still have an erection. It's got nothing to do with the sphincter. So when a man has a nerve sparing prostatectomy, it doesn't mean they've spared the nerve of the sphincter. And it may have been damaged because it sits around the distal end of the, of the um, prostate. There's also urethral length. So you lose some of the urethral length. That means there's less real estate across which the sphincter is able to then compress the urethra. So that may have an impact as well. So we can measure that with ultrasound. We can measure the um, sphincter length, the urethral length, and we can measure the shortening of, contraction of the sphincter. The bladder, the urethra is now shorter. So two things happen. The distal bit's got to go up and your penis gets shorter the bladder has to get, put, get pulled down, and that's going to change the mechanics. It's going to change the shape of the bladder neck. It's going to change the location in which the bladder is sitting relative to those structures. Because the bladder is lower, it's now possible that the pubic rectalis is sitting behind the bladder and not behind the urethra, and when it contracts, it may squeeze the bladder and not the urethra. That could be a problem, I would suggest. So we need to think about that as well. And the other thing is that when you have a conventional radical prostatectomy, they remove the anterior um, supporting mechanisms, so the pubovisceral and puboprostatic ligaments. So there's going to be less support for the whole bladder and urinary structure. So the bladder is going to sit lower. So you lose your smooth muscle. It interferes with the bladder neck. The sphincter might be injured. You have a lower bladder position, and you're going to reduce some of that anterior support. There's a whole lot of things that might go wrong that you might want to address with intervention. So what happens with prostatectomy? Well, all of those things that I've said. The bladder is lower. The anorectal junction is now sitting in some men actually behind the bladder. There is a, a forward position of the um, bulb of penis because the urethra is now tight and pulled just behind the pubic symphysis. So it's going to now be pulling the whole penile bulb forwards and um, there's going to be no change at all in the, the location of the, the sphincter. And, oh. so, and when we look at movement, we see that the anorectal junction, urethral vesicle junction, have less motion. So there's compromised contraction of the pubic There is less ventral motion of the bulb of penis, and that may be because of a structural position change. And the mid-urethra, in fact, we, only, we see that it only has no motion. Of the um, 33 men that we tested in this first study, there was only one man who couldn't contract his sphincter. There was 12 men who had less contraction, but only one man who had no contraction. So it's not that common to have nothing happening with your sphincter. So that's good, good news for those men. But we need to evaluate it because we need to know who that one is who doesn't have it because that's the man who's going to absolutely have to get the other muscles superhuman to compensate. So prostate, prostatectomy modifies the mechanics of the puberectalis and bulbocavenosis. It doesn't change the sphincter as much, and, but there are some men where it's a problem. Are these changes related to early incontinence? And here is a fascinating study that we just did in, in collaboration with a clinician from Sydney, Stuart Baptist. And 
what we did was to take um, a whole group, well, 60 of his patients who were being treated in routine clinical care, and he measured them for us pre and post prostatectomy. And he gave a very um, regimented protocol of training, of, uh, of education to train the pelvic floor muscles pre and um, post op so that we could evaluate the impact. And we found some really interesting things. And the first thing was that, as we'd shown in that previous study, the sphincter. Didn't re wasn't changed, its contraction wasn't changed by the procedure in, in, on average. But what we did find was that when you ask a man to show us a contraction of your pelvic floor without any specific and really detailed instruction, there was no difference between the men who then went on to be incontinent or continent. But if we gave them a single session of learning how to contract their sphincter, some men could learn to do that well, and some men couldn't in a single session. And the ones who learnt to do it well in a single session were more likely to be continent after surgery. So what that says is just telling a man, contract your pelvic floor, doesn't really cut it. But if you give them specific detailed instruction of contracting this pelvic floor and they learn to contract their sphincter and do it well, they're less likely to be continent later, incontinent later. So I think that's really helpful for physio. Um, and then after training, there was a, um, a, a tendency for a greater contraction. There was a significant improvement in the men who had the specific who in the group who were continent, um, but um, what's the word? Um, disappointingly close to being significantly significant to actually have a, a difference between these two white dots. So they could change, but we didn't see a significance there. None of the other muscles were affected by specifically teaching men to contract. So we could, so the anorectal junction, voluntary, there was less, active, less elevation after prostatectomy, there was less motion with a cough, it wasn't improved by training, and it didn't have any impact on whether men were incontinent or continent, bulbocavenosis, the same. So when we look at those data in a little bit more detail, the men who were incontinent did have a shorter urethra. There was a significant correlation between having incontinence and having an inability to, short, to contract their sphincter. There was a significant correlation between incontinence and having a shorter urethra, but the contraction of the muscle and the length of the urethra were not related to each other, meaning they both independently relate to incontinence. So it's not just because the urethra is shorter that men are incontinent. So, the sphincter does seem to be important. We can improve it with training. Men can learn to contract it, and it has an impact on their continence outcomes. What happens in standing in these men? The answer is actually really simple, and that is men can still contract in standing after they've had a prostatectomy, and it's all the same. Things are lower, they don't move, and they, they lift a bit further because they're a bit more mobile. So you can evaluate in standing in these men, and you do expect a difference in position because things sag down, um, but men are able to contract, and there's more potential for displacement because of that loss of support. So my final slide then is to say that we've got lots of other studies happening at the moment that are about to be submitted. One's looking at the amount of displacement that you would expect during breathing, quiet breathing and, and loaded breathing. We've got work looking at electrical stimulation. If you stick a stick, if you place delicately a stimulating probe inside the anus, do you expect to get a urethral sphincter contraction? And you do because the, pubic, the nerves pass next to the... Um, the um, anus, so you're actually able to stimulate the sphincter and what we're looking at is the relative um, stimulation intensities and things. Shear wave elastography, as you heard from Rachel, and our RCT, the recruitment finishes in one month time, so we'll have our outcomes in the coming year. So we can compensate for the smooth muscles by using striated muscles. We, um, it seems that the sphincter is the most important, but if we have to use the other muscles, we can do it, they just have to be superhuman to get there. And, okay, of course, we can't forget the bladder because men have to learn to store urine in the bladder. And our trial, if you want to le learn more about our big RCT, it's called MatchUp and there's a protocol paper. And if you want to learn about the intervention that we're applying in that study, we have a, um, a, a paper that describes the exercise intervention that we're using trying to um, personalise management for men post-prostatectomy. So, 
that is where I'll finish and thank all the people I work with in the lab to do these experiments. So thank you. That was wonderful. Okay, so Marty Klein is a, for our next presenter, Marty Klein is a veteran sex therapist working with individuals and couples for over 40 years. He is an award-winning author of seven books about sexuality. He works at the interface between psychology and medicine. I love the title of his talk. <laughs> he will discuss a model of the sexual health beyond function and dysfunction. He will also address the important difference between arousal and desire and the role of chronic pain in sexual behavior. We are sorry that Marty could not be here with us, but he has kindly recorded his talk. And there are no slides, so you get to just sit back and listen. Hello, I'm Dr. Marty Klein, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified sex therapist. I practiced for 40 years here in Palo Alto, California, the heart of Silicon Valley. I want to start by telling you a true story. Some years ago, I spoke to um, a couple of hundred uh, hand injury therapists, PTs and OTs, at a conference at Stanford. And I, asked, uh, I started by asking everybody, um, have you ever noticed how crabby hand injury patients are? And everybody said, oh, yeah, all those hand injury patients are always complaining and this and that. And I said, how many of you have asked your hand injury patients about masturbation? And you could have heard a pin drop in the room. And I said, have you ever considered that maybe that's why they're so crabby? So today I want to talk to you about psychosexual aspects of men's health um, in the arena of uh, physical therapy. And... Let's remember what we want patients to do, right? We want them to do their home exercise program. We want them to take their medication. We want them to uh, talk with one or more loved ones about their situation when they need help, not if they need help. We want them to be able to ask for it. We want them to please don't drink too much alcohol. And we want patients to realize that their attitude has crucial value in their recovery. We also want patients to know that they're lovable, that they can still enjoy sex. If they're male, yep, you're still a male. And that sexually, communication and self-acceptance are more important than anything else. So our work should include a challenge to patients. How are you going to grow in order to experience these truths? Because they are true and they're part of treatment. Now, a primary role for PTs, in addition to all the other stuff that PTs do, is to have conversations with patients that MDs are too busy for. And if you're an MD uh, watching or listening uh, to my program, um, if you're one of those MDs that actually talks to patients a lot that, about sexuality, that's great. Here in California, at least, not every physician does that. So, because PTs have so much more time with patients than MDs, they have the opportunity to have conversations with patients that physicians are just too busy for or that they're embarrassed to have or that they forget are so necessary. What are some of the topics that a PT can talk to a patient about? Well, for starters, masturbation. If a person's body part is compromised uh, that they typically rely on for masturbation, how are they going to give themselves pleasure? And obviously, uh, that involves hands, but it's not only hands. You know, it's elbows, it's shoulders, it's weight-bearing joints, it's how people turn over in bed, it's uh, whether people uh, are used to masturbating in the shower and now they have trouble in the shower. So there's a lot to talk about with regard to injuries uh, and continence and masturbation. There's shame and embarrassment, particularly around issues of continence and incontinence. A lot of patients don't see this as just another medical issue. It has a very special emotional, psychological impact on people. And suddenly, um, what used to be a sexual body part is now a problematized and damaged body part. So um, there's no way around that. I think we're better off as professionals talking to patients rather than 
um, pretending that it's not a problem. There's the question of sexual failure. Leaking urine during a sexual encounter with a partner can, uh, shouldn't have, it doesn't have to be uh, a disaster, but for a lot of people it is. And so we need to talk to them about that. And if as a result, people are experiencing secondary erection problems or desire problems, then we want to address that. And patients are typically not going to bring it up with us. We have to bring it up with patients. Continence issues can bring up an existential crisis, particularly since uh, they generally don't happen when people are 24 years old. They're more likely to happen at midlife or later. And so that just adds to the sense of what is life all about? What is the rest of my life going to be about? Are the best parts of my life over now? Of course, uh, issues of fertility. We know that um, uh, con incontinence doesn't necessarily affect fertility at all. It all depends on the source. But patients um, may be very concerned about that. And we need to, to ask them if they're concerned about that. And if the, con the incontinence is part of, um, part of a medical issue that's going to affect fertility, we should uh, talk about that as well. Uh, incontinence makes nudity more embarrassing for people. Some people need to wear a diaper. And uh, for that, for them, uh, that makes nudity just completely off limits um, whenever they're uh, with a partner. And th for some people, that's a terrible loss. Uh, for people who are single, when do you tell a new partner? Uh, this is the same old question about I have herpes. When do I just found out I have herpes. When do I tell a new partner? I just found out I'm infertile. When do I tell a new partner? And um, this is just another one of those, when do I tell a new partner for single people? And what that means is that if somebody is out in the marketplace um, dating or uh, choosing a new partner, there's a new criterion that they, um, that they have to be looking at, which is, or that they should be looking at, which is, not only do I want a partner who I'm attracted to and have shared values and so on, I want to make sure that they have empathy and flexibility so that there's room for incontinence or continence-related uh, difficulties. So what's a way that you can raise a, a question like that? Well, for starters, you can ask sexually, do you feel like a different person now? Um, everyone has questions uh, about, about sex. What are yours? That's a real common, uh, a real common way that you can start a conversation with patients. You can ask patients um, what their sexual experience is like now. And you can uh, also um, inquire, is there a sexual conversation that you want to have with your, with your mate uh, or, or a new partner that I can be helpful with? Now, some patients have chronic pain. Some patients have acute pain. Some patients are afraid of pain. These, while obviously these are all different, they all affect people in a similar way. Uh, they create inhibition, they create anger, and for many patients, they lead to depression and withdrawal. And so uh, we should not judge, as professionals, we shouldn't judge, well, there's not a lot of pain, so it's not that much of a problem uh, psychologically, or um, it's sporadic rather than chronic. Whatever the kind of pain or even fear of pain somebody is experiencing, uh, we really do want to check what is the downstream effect of that. And those of us who are of an age, we've probably experienced one of these three, uh, maybe all three at different times in our lives. And we know that um, if, you, if you're cooking, um, I, I had a hand injury myself a few years ago. And so while I was cooking, it would hurt to hold a knife in a certain way. And that, that doesn't just mean, well, I won't hold a knife in that way. It means that the whole act of cooking is tinged with sadness and resentment, depending on the day of the week. So let's be aware of that, please. So what keeps us from talking about sex with patients, regardless of, of what, the, what the medical uh, or physical issues are? Many professionals are inhibited for, about talking with patients about sex. Um, some of us are afraid of offending the patients. Some of us um, 
we feel like that's not our specialty. So uh, better to say nothing than to say something um, that isn't going to be expert. Uh, many of us are raised in households where talking about sex is impolite. For a lot of us, um, we have an imperfect sex life, maybe a very unsatisfying sex life. And does that disqualify us from talking as professionals with patients? Of course it doesn't. But for some professionals, that has an inhibiting effect. That's true with psychologists too, by the way. A lot of psychologists feel, listen, my own sex life's not that great, so I have no business talking to patients about it. Not true, not true. Um, here in America, uh, physical therapists and, and other medical professionals are mandated reporters. And um, uh, some professionals are concerned that if I raise the subject of sex, I'm going to hear stuff that I'm going to have to report that's going to make life complicated for everybody. So maybe I should just uh, skip it. Well, let's talk a little bit about normal sex. People are always asking me, probably you too, people, but certainly me, people are always asking me, what's normal sex? How many how many times a week, how many inches, how many gallons, what is normal sex? And um, I generally don't answer that question. People generally um, don't do wholesome things with that data. Um, what, what, why do people ask? People ask because they want to compare themselves to uh, what's sexually normal. And um, either they're going to say, well, I guess I'm not normal, or they're going to turn to their partner and say, see, you're not normal. We don't want that. So when you think about it, no matter what gender a person is, people of all genders, or as we used to say, all men and women, people of all genders want the same stuff when it comes to sex. They want pleasure. They want closeness. They want to feel less anxious. They want to feel adequate. They want to feel special. So to, to segregate people um, and say these people are normal and those aren't, that just um, doesn't match the lived experience of our patients. All of our patients, whether they have sex once a year or once a day, they, they want to feel not anxious during sex. They want to feel adequate. They want to feel seen. Uh, and similarly, people of all genders, they're anxious about the same stuff. Am I attractive? Is my performance, I hate that word, my performance, is that going to be adequate? Um, am I going to uh, uh, reveal something about myself to my partner that my partner is going to get terribly turned off about? And of course, all genders, not just uh, people from sexual minorities, but all genders, the most normative, not normal, the most normative uh, people or people in the most normative categories still wrestling with cultural messages that make them feel bad, whether it's about their body, whether it's about their uh, fantasies, preferences, et cetera. And this is all exacerbated when people have continence issues. It's very, very easy for someone who used to be, um, in their own mind, attractive, and now that they have continence issues, to feel unattractive. It's easy for men who have never had erection difficulties, now that, they, um, now that their penis uh, is problematized, to wonder, am I going to have reliable erections after this? And in my perfect world, every one of these patients would be talking to a psychologist with a lot of background in sexuality. In the real world, most of these patients are not. Most of your patients are not going to be talking to psychologists with a background in sexuality. These conversations may fall to you. Well, I hope that you will uh, feel emboldened to have these conversations with patients and not to worry that you're going to do it perfectly. You're not going to do it perfectly. You don't have nearly the practice or the background, most of you, uh, to have this conversation in a perfect way. And even if you do, then patients come in and they make sure that we don't have perfect conversations with them. So I hope you feel emboldened to talk to patients, at the very least to ask them, is there anything about sex that you want to ask me about? Or most people have questions about sex. What are yours? Not do you have a question, but what is your question? That really helps people uh, open up. Now, if we really believe that sex uh, is about emotional connection, then everybody is eligible for enjoyable sex, regardless of their body. 
That's a message that we want to give to all patients. By the way, not just continence patients, of course. People uh, who are struggling with um, a limited range of motion in their hips, people who uh, are taking medication that makes their mouth smell bad, people who are losing their hair, people who are get, getting hair where they don't want it, uh, people who are going through chemotherapy. If we really believe that sex is not just about body parts, but it's about people and about emotions, then everybody is eligible for enjoyable sex. They just have to figure out how to configure the bodies to deliver that enjoyable sex. So my alternative vision of sexuality is that uh, rather than sex being about increasing excitement, like in pornography, it's about relaxation. And my alternative vision has people with realistic expectations. Sex at 60 is not going to be like sex at 25. Desire is not going to feel at 60 like it's at 25. And my alternative vision is that people cannot fail at sex. If people show up and they're present, they can't fail at sex. And most people don't feel that way. And as a medical professional, you're in a unique position to let people know that it doesn't matter what your body looks like, smells like, um, how different it is now than the way it used to be. You can't fail at sex. And, and that your body is fine for sex as it is. It's not the way you might prefer it. It's not the way that person's body is. But your body is fine for sex as it is. And that when it comes to sexuality, hopefully, there's nothing that people can't talk about. You know, if you watch people in restaurants or in the supermarket, they give themselves permission to talk about every aspect of sex, uh, uh, of food, I'm sorry, <laughs> every aspect of food, what it looks like, what it smells like, the packaging, the speed at which it's put in front of you, uh, the variety, uh, every, the, the, the way that their partner is eating, gee, you have a little sauce on your chin there, or, gee, you're buying a whole, lot of, uh, a whole lot of cake, maybe you wanna buy a little bit more vegetables there. So whatever the context of food is, People give themselves complete permission to talk about food and to talk about eating. And in my perfect world, people are like that about sexuality too. People can say, gee, a quarter of an inch to the left would be really great right now. People can say, wait, 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 I think I'm changing my mind here. I thought I wanted sex, but it turns out I just want a lot of hugging right now. In my perfect world, people, when they have to, uh, they have to urinate in the middle of sex, that what they do is they say, Excuse me, I'll be right back. Don't go away. Don't finish without me. I'll be right back. Um, you'd be amazed at the number of people who come to me and pay good American dollars to ask me, what should I do if I have to pee in the middle of sex? Um, and in my perfect world, people understand that sex itself has no built-in inherent meaning. It has no inherent hierarchy. There are no activities that are better or more normal than other activities. And I understand that people want sex to have meaning, which is fine. People give meaning to sex. People uh, create experiences and then they decide what they mean. And in my perfect world, medical professionals are letting people know you're in charge of the meanings of sexuality. Sex isn't in charge of your experience. You're in charge of sexuality. And if there are things that you want to do that are meaningful and your partner is on board, that's what you do. And if there are things that, that hurt to do them, that aren't as pleasant as they used to be, that don't make sense anymore, if there are things that everybody else seems to be talking about, but you don't want to do it, it's really okay. Uh, we really want to let patients know that regardless of what their equipment is doing, they can still create sexual pleasure. Because sex is not about what the bodies do, it's about how the people feel. Let me say that again, and you can read it again. Sex is not about what the bodies do. It's about how the people feel. And so when, when patients ask us for our practical suggestions for improving sex, despite incontinence, despite mastectomy, despite anything, the most practical suggestions for improving sex are self-acceptance and communication. Notice there's nothing here about Explosive orgasms is nothing here about uh, hours and hours of penis vagina intercourse. Self-acceptance and communication. Those are the things 
that are going to reliably improve sex for people way more reliably than anything else that they can possibly do. So as a reminder, we want to help, uh, we want to help people understand that focusing on their genitalia ultimately undermines sexual satisfaction, not supports it. We want to help people reduce their anxiety about whether or not they're normal. Is it normal to, uh, to leak urine uh, during sex? And when people are anxious about that, that, um, uh, that undermines their intimacy and satisfaction way more than the urine itself would, right? Um, we want to remind patients that being present is much more important to satisfaction than traditional uh, met metrics of function, you know, erection and lubrication and all that. Um, and that when people want to increase their desire or want to increase their satisfaction, that involves acquiring emotional skills more than technical skills, more than a new toy, more than a new position. And that the similarities between male and female sexuality are way more important than the differences in adults because sex is way more than an activity. Sex is an idea. And that's something that we as professionals want to promote with our patients. So thank you so much for your time. If you'd like a copy of the slide deck, just go to my website, martyklein.com slash ICS. And now let's have a couple of minutes of Q&A. Okay, now what does everyone want to go do? <laughs> so Marty's email has been um, put into the live chat in addition to his website, so questions can be uh, forwarded to him after. And again, in the interest of um, staying on time, uh, questions for Paul can be maybe done also in the chat. Well, yes. Okay, perfect. And then I'm going to pass the mic over to Paula, our new chair of the Physiotherapy Committee. Thank you. Um, um, hi, guys. We're almost there. Um, first of all, um, I would like to thank you um, um, to all of you for being here with us. Um, we know sometimes how difficult it is to get uh, funding and some of you are traveling from all over the place, so thank you very much for coming. Secondly, um, thank you for the speakers. Um, I'm sure you all agree that it's been a fabulous session that has actually involved all areas of pelvic health physiotherapy, so it's great. Um, thank you for Heidi and Marie to put this uh, amazing um, session together. Um, also, I'm going to thank you very much to Heather for her time um, as a PT chair. So please, um, let's um, remember her. Um, thank you, Heather. We're going to miss you. And also, um, thank you very much, Nelly. You have done over six years in the physiotherapy committee. Um, so thank you very much for Nelly as well. <laughs> but um, we are going to work uh, with her for uh, our next meeting in Toronto, which takes me um, to uh, my, <laughs> my first uh, Quest is that um, you know that we would love to hear from you, so please do uh, fill the um, survey feedback. We listen to your comments, so anything you liked, anything you didn't like, anything you want us to change about how we run the PT forum, please do write back to us. Um, I'm going to say um, congratulations to all of you. I'm not sure if you're aware that today is International Physiotherapy Day. Yes? <laughs> so... Cheers for all of us, yes, sitting down in here. And, um, and most importantly now, um, I've just been told that drinks are ready, okay? I think we all deserve a drink. So you need to go uh, outside and turn left. Thank you very much all for coming. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Okay, just one plea. Can these people over here move over here because we want to take a picture for Twitter? Is that all right? We're celebrating International Physio Day and the Physiotherapy Committee. Come on. <laughs> Come on.
if you don't want to, of course, you can leave, yes. <laughs> but for the ones that you want to come in the uh, pictures, go and sit down on this side and we'll take it from outside. Yeah? PT committee. PT committee and speakers at the front, come on. We can do this. The wine is waiting for you. <laughs> Marie. <laughs> 